Hearing the distant chatter, the toll of school bells, see how Phantom Hive is now becoming a public school kid. Will he get to know the epic highs and lows of high school football? Probably not, but he will experience the highs and lows of navigating social situations with other kids his age and the petty drama that comes along with it. Yes, I wrote a Riverdale joke into this. I never actually finished that show. But the <laughs> <laughs> but its influence is felt. <laughs> this arc, the Weston arc, or the public school arc, is one of my favorites. I love boarding school settings, or any setting that is basically forced proximity, forces the characters to be around each other for an extended period of time. This is probably why I like D&D &D so much, because everyone is traveling together. The characters are working together, living together, and spending a lot of time together, so there's a lot of room for connecting with others and also interpersonal drama. These settings are really great for more character-driven stories, and while Black Butler is fairly character-driven, the Weston arc really takes the cake. Coming off the action-packed waters of the Campania arc, Yana Taboso lets us get comfortable in a new and educational environment. The fighting takes a back seat for more creative problem solving, and we're back to solving mysteries in a way where we actually get to go on the investigation along with Ciel and Sebastian, instead of skipping over it and jumping into the action. So get your pens and paper ready, because we are attending Weston College. Oh no! <laughs> It's the very first panel of the arc, and Ciel is already running late. I also think it's funny that all of the scans online, and I'm assuming when the chapter was released in G-Fantasy, um, there's a little box letting you know that this is, in fact, Black Butler, in case you couldn't tell. Weston is a far cry from the previous arcs, and the stylistic elements that Yana Toboso is borrowing from shoujo manga that aren't normally in Black Butler could be confusing for the reader. I mean... The running late, toast in mouth is a common cliche amongst high school manga. I'm pretty sure it's mostly shoujo that does this, but I have not verified that information, but I think most infamously, Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon does this, and I think that's what most people are going to call back from when they see this kind of trope. <laughs> Mostly because I think most people I interact with, Sailor Moon was among their first anime or manga. So that could be why. It's a fun reference though, so that's cool. Ciel is now attending Weston College, a prestigious public school on the bank of the River Thames. It's said to be the best school in England, but don't be fooled by its status as a public school. It's not like an American public school. Weston does in fact charge tuition, but it's not a for-profit school, and the public part basically just means anyone who can pay can attend. Weston is actually based around a real-life school called Eton College in London, and some of the traditions and the visuals that take place in the manga are borrowed from the real traditions and the real-life school, which is pretty cool. While we're at it, rules and tradition are a huge deal at Weston, and Ciel has to make sure that he sets out on the right foot, acting as an upstanding student amongst those seeking to become perfect gentlemen. However, things don't go his way as he steps foot onto the grass, something that causes a stir. Ciel isn't even one of the prefix, how dare he step on the lawn? Everybody knows that the only people allowed to touch grass are the prefix. Everyone else has to be a filthy little gamer. <laughs> as soon as they're mentioned, we get an introduction to the it boys of Weston, the prefix. Prefix are students who hold a bit of authority. They're senior students who have been authorized to enforce discipline. This is something that is a real position for students at schools in England. I know this because some YouTubers I used to watch in high school talked about their days in school and about being a prefect. Um, I just wanted to point this out because a lot of American fans think that Yana Toboso stole the idea from Harry Potter and Weston also has a house system. So people just consider it Black Butler but Harry Potter and for reasons that I can't quite put a 
put a pen on that really irks me <laughs> so i just wanted to get that out of the way um this is just how some schools do it in england from what i've gathered weston is not a copy of harry potter and i will die on this hill anyway the prefix four distinct characters that seem to perfectly sum up their respective houses the pretty one zeroes in on CL, making bystanders think that this kid is really about to get it. But instead, he fixes CL's tie and asks him for his name. At Weston, everyone goes by last names. The pretty prefect wonders why he's never heard of this phantom hive, but the sporty prefix chimes in. The headmaster did mention a new student joining Blue House. That must be phantom hive. The nerdy prefect then recites the rule that only prefix and those given special permission are allowed to traverse the lawn. Ciel could have at least memorized the school rules first, jeez. The emo prefect urges for the others to hurry up and get inside. The pretty one gives Ciel a warning and they're off. Before Ciel can really process what just happened here, we meet the best character in all of Black Butler, my self insert, Macmillan. He makes fast friends with Ciel. They're both first form Blue House students, and Macmillan is the guy to know if you need a rundown on what's going on at the school. I just know that this kid would be devouring YouTube drama commentary videos if he were around today. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> Macmillan explains for Ciel and the reader that the whys people were talking about is a penalty point. And for each point, you're made to write a Latin poem 100 times. He also explains the P4, which are what the prefix are called shorthandedly, uh, giving a quick rundown on who everyone is. The prefix, the only group wearing colored waistcoats, house captains, if you will. The pretty one, Edgar Redmond, is the prefect of Scarlet Fox, the red one. The house for students of particularly noble status. There's a lot of pretty blonde boys in this house. <laughs> I'm sure like every background character from uh, this house will probably be animated with like blonde hair um, in the anime. We'll have to see. Uh, the sporty one is Herman Greenhill, the prefect for Green Lion, the house of students who excel at martial arts and sports. They're the jocks, more or less. The nerdy one, Lawrence Bluer, the prefect for Sapphire Owl, the house of students who excel in academics, the nerdy ones. And finally, the emo one, Gregory Violet, the prefect for Violet Wolf, the house for students who are accomplished in the arts. They're eccentric, they're weirdos, they're probably the more relatable ones for most Black Butler fans if we're being real. So you've got the rich and the beautiful, the jocks, the bookworms, and the art kids. What more do you need? Also, yes, the houses are based on stereotypes of students, um, but it's fun. And I also think it's funny that every prefect, their surname, just quite literally has the color of their house in it. And that's so fun. It makes it easy to tell what house you would be in. Um, personally, I'd easily be in Violet Wolf, but I think I could also be in Sapphire Owl. It probably would depend on the mood that the headmaster was in when assigning me. I could very easily go into both, I think. I don't know. I think the only reason I think I would fit in Sapphire Owl is because, um, I have a long history of kinning Macmillan. <laughs> so that's probably a huge factor. Uh, what about you though? What house would you be in if you are so inclined to go to Weston, metaphorically? <laughs> Macmillan seems to really respect and admire the P4, which is what the prefix are collectively called. To be honest, I believe most students really admire the P4. They're the ideal to strive towards, so it's not just a Macmillan thing. Ciel doesn't really get the whole fanning over the P4 though. He also thinks some of the rules at Weston are silly, and he's right. But Macmillan explains that it's just, you know, tradition, so why question it? <laughs> Something that is very important at Weston, and it will come up a lot, but before Macmillan can elaborate, they've got to get to class, because the bells are ringing and everyone knows, um, 
if the bells are ringing, you gotta go. You can't have this conversation anymore. <laughs> we get a bit of a flashback to Ciel receiving the letter from the queen. This scene is actually what was in the announcement teaser for the new anime season, actually. The queen is sending him well wishes after the horror that was the Campania incident, wishing him a happy Easter, which we know he had a pretty good Easter because that's how the Campania arc wrapped up with that silly little uh, in-between chapter. However, the queen was unable to enjoy her holiday. She's got something weighing her down. Her cousin's son is the source of the worry. Derek Arden, a student in his fifth year at Weston, has not returned home since last summer and has also stopped riding home. He's basically dropped off the face of the earth, which is weird because he used to write every day, but his letters abruptly stopped. It's all rather suspicious, actually, and she is sending Ciel to go check it out. It's not just Derek who's fallen prone to this suspicious change, though. Other students have also not returned home and basically dropped off the face of the earth. So it's looking less like a rebellious phase and more like an actual issue that Ciel needs to get to the bottom of. Find out if these kids are okay, and if not, what happened to them? The families are suffering and the queen's cousin is losing heart, so I mean, it makes sense. Ciel seems to understand the mission pretty quickly. Public schools are independent institutions that refuse government interventions. Very different from American public schools who are completely government funded. <laughs> However, this will make it hard to lay a finger on Weston. Schools tend to worry about public perception and appearances, so they don't want any issues going public, which is still an issue for school and colleges today, honestly. <laughs> Sebastian doesn't seem to find this interesting, though. Humans are so caught up in how they're seen that they'll bend over backwards just to keep an image, even when that should be the least of their concerns. I think we kind of have a, a good vibe of what the internal conflict will be here. The Queen needs someone to infiltrate Weston, but only sons of aristocrats can attend, meaning Ciel is quite literally the only person who can do this job. Well, Aloise probably could if he were real and in the manga, and we already know what he'd look like if he attended Weston. <laughs> Ciel decides his best bet is to just attend Weston as himself. A disguise would be dangerous since he is acquainted with many who hold titles, and he himself holds a title, so like, it just, it wouldn't be weird for him to be there. He says this, but, like, literally the only other student we see him recognize at Weston is his cousin. Um, so I don't know who else he had in mind. This kid does not socialize. Sebastian threatens murder. Okay, he doesn't really, but Ciel does bring up that the biggest issue is whether or not there is an open spot for him to attend. He tells Sebastian he needs to make one, which usually when someone says this, they mean killing someone, but there are other ways to make a person leave school, I guess. Ciel will handle the investigation, but he still needs Sebastian's support. It does seem that Ciel leaves it up to Sebastian to figure out how he can support the young master. And we're back to the present, where Ciel and McMillan have made it to class. An upperclassman had suddenly withdrawn from school. McMillan lets us know, um, letting the reader know what happened, or what happened on paper, to allow Ciel to attend. He lies, saying he'd been on the waiting list for quite a while, so it was no problem coming to school at such a weird time. Starting school in the spring, in the middle of the semester, can't be easy. Someone barges in, yelling, boy up! Me when the boys fall out or something. Uh, that was a fallout boy joke, sorry. <laughs> McMillan quickly explains that the last one to gather when that command is issued has to do the upperclassmen's chores. And you know our boy is going to be last because of course he is. And Ciel is tasked with polishing the prefix shoes. Does he even know how to do that? Um, but hey, this guy did say when he returns to the dormitory, they'll hold his welcome party, which we skip to. We don't get to see Ciel struggle to polish shoes. Um, Ciel walks in and is hazed. 
Just as he's thinking he doesn't need a welcome party at that. We know Ciel is not here to go to school for real and make real connections and like genuinely be here. <laughs> he's thinking it'll be a temporary thing for the investigation, so he's not really making an effort to make friends. But also, Ciel is not much of a party guy. He's not a very social fellow. So this whole ordeal where he's the center of attention around strangers is so out of the realm of what he is comfortable with. Also, I was not joking. This kid is literally hazed. It's not like the dangerous near death hazings that American colleges and like fraternities are known for. Um, but he's tossed up in the air on a parachute and the upperclassman has like an evil look on his face. It's all in good fun though. He claims it's the traditional welcome of the Sapphire Owl House. There's that idea again, tradition. Doing things just because that's what everyone has done before you. No other reason. Doing something because someone decided that that's the way it should be done from here on out and like don't question it. Doing something because it's tradition, obviously. Before CL can be tossed again though, the housemaster catches them, threatening wives for the noise. The other boys leave Ciel on the ground, running to save themselves from penalty. The housemaster calls out the upperclassman, Clayton, for participating in the silly joke. Clayton tries to explain that it's tradition and it seems to work, I guess? The housemaster, who we have only seen the shoulder and foot of, goes to help Ciel up. And that's when we see that the Sapphire Owl housemaster is none other than Housemaster Michaelis. Sebastian. And this is when a lot of fans decided that they had a thing for men in robes or teacher position of some kind. Um, basically what I'm trying to say is a lot of people thought that Sebastian looked very hot here and they might have learned something about themselves. Um, not me though, y'all stay safe. <laughs> A traditional recap, in case you skipped the last chapter because you didn't think that it was Black Butler. But this time, Ciel does not step on the grass. He's getting used to the weird and wacky rules of his new environment. Ciel meets with the P4 and the Vice Headmaster in the Headmaster's office. It's a pretty standard, hey, you've been here for a day, are you settling in okay kind of meeting. Redmond offers him a transfer into Scarlet Fox if he's not enjoying Sapphire Owl, but only the headmaster can pick which house the students are sorted into. The P4 does also specify that um, Weston is protected by tradition and discipline. I want to point out this line because there's a bit of a theme being built here. Tradition is being treated as something that holds more importance than anything else at this school, than anything else in their lives. Tradition is everything, and tradition should be upheld. The vice headmaster also apologizes for stepping in, since it's usually the main headmaster who conducts this meeting, but the headmaster is oh so terribly busy, or so they say. It's then explained that the headmaster is the end-all be-all when it comes to how things go at Weston. It's his word that's absolute. It's reiterated that the P4 have been selected as those who will uphold the headmaster's wishes. It's tradition, and here at Weston, tradition is absolute. Yeah, this is gonna be related to the climax of the whole story arc, isn't it? I'm calling it now. And I'm not just saying that because I know how this ends. <laughs> Ciel vows to follow the rules of the institution and has to sign a contract. This is something that even public schools in America do for those who don't go to school in America. I remember having to sign a paper about how I understood the rules at my school and would follow them, which is kind of wild really, especially considering that I didn't have a choice in doing so because if I didn't sign the contract, then I would, um, risk like discipline and I don't know if I would get kicked out but like it would have been a really big deal and also I lived in an area where if I could not pay for school that was my only option <laughs> but it makes more sense at Weston because this is not mandatory schooling 
It's not, I mean, it is K through 12, but it, like it's not K through 12. <laughs> <laughs> and the students all went out of their way to attend here. So it is a bit different and it does make sense to basically have them sign a contract before they can really like go to school. Um, also just making sure everyone's on the same page. However, the vice headmaster does take an odd tumble while taking the paper to CL, but he gets up like nothing happened despite the blood pouring down his face. It's played off as um, comedic in some sort of way. Um, his ability to just ignore the embarrassing things is quite impressive, but I want you to remember this because it happens a lot. And for those of us who know how this story arc ends, that is foreshadowing that something is just not right with this guy. But at the time, Ciel does not think much of it and signs the paper with no comment. Ciel requests to greet the headmaster, but the P4 explain that they are the only students allowed to see him, effectively locking Ciel out of whatever he needed from the headmaster for his investigation. This whole scene is actually really neat. The way that the P4 and the vice headmaster are bathed in shadow for a lot of this exchange adds an ambience of unease. There's something not right here but we only have a couple of puzzle pieces to work with and the rest of the picture is still being obscured. For those who know how the story goes, it's really neat foreshadowing that these people aren't what they seem, hiding some dark secret in the shadows. Sure, the room they're in appears to be mostly lit by windows, making it a dimly lit space with harsh contrasting shadows and that's just how it would be in real life, but Yana Toboso made that design decision for a reason. We get some exposition on what public schools are, familiarizing the readers with just what kind of setting Weston is. A place where boys 13 to 18 live together in dormitories while devoting themselves to their studies. Every aspect of their lives is dictated by the school's appointed schedule and rules. A day in the life of a Weston student sees an early rise at 6.30 in the morning, tea by 7, class at 7.30, then breakfast at 9.00. Sial does not elaborate further. I do think it's cute that Macmillan is sticking by his new friend though, making him feel welcome. Before we continue, I do need to say that the use of this word isn't entirely related to the slur. It's a term used to describe an errand boy or servant of sorts, but it does make for some wild, out of context screenshots. And I tried to do a little bit of research into like where this term originated from, but I um, didn't go that thorough. I just went thorough enough to for Google to be like, yeah, it's not really the same thing. Um, but I personally am not going to be saying this word aloud because I just don't want that audio of me saying <laughs> saying that to be taken out of context and used against me. Um, so I'm sorry if that's a little weird. Also, sorry to those who were just listening while they work on stuff and now have to glance over at the screen to see what the fuck I'm talking about. All right, now that we're all on the same page, I will be changing that terminology. <laughs> Macmillan is explaining to Ciel about this designated time for the servant type of activities. Ciel says it sounds like playing butlers, and that's pretty much what I'll be calling it from here on out. He then asks if Prefix have these play butlers, to which Macmillan answers yes, and that Clayton is the pretend play butler for Bluer, the prefix for Blue House. Um, Macmillan then explains that these play butlers are different from real butlers in the sense that sometimes the older student will take care of his play butler. And there's a sort of brotherly bond between the two while at school. And being a play butler for a prefect is actually very special, as they get to wear their house flowers on their lapels, like the P4, cross the lawn with permission, and they also get to take part in the midnight tea party, which is hosted by the headmaster. I think we know one thing that's going to be happening at one point in this story arc. So Ciel is starting to concoct a plan. Well, okay, he's gathering intel still, but now that he's got a lead for how to come in contact with the headmaster, the cogs are turning. That kid is cooking. Ciel decides to try a more direct path into figuring out what might be going on with Derek Arden. So he just outright asks Macmillan about Arden, 
However, as soon as he mentions the name and the fact that he's in Scarlet House or Scarlet Fox House, um, Red House, whatever, everybody around him seems to be taken aback and they start whispering, clutching their pearls even. Macmillan explains that Ciel will alienate himself if he mingles with the other houses too much, which seems a bit odd considering like one of the main reasons of going to West End is probably building connections with other people in similar social classes as you, but there's this competitive air between the houses because they often face off in different competitions. Macmillan does know something about what happened with Arden though. He knows that Arden was transferred from Scarlet Fox to Violet Wolf as a special case. He doesn't know too much else though. He doesn't know why or how or like anything other than the fact that like that was a thing that happened. The rumor goes that it was just under the headmaster's orders and that's all there was. He warned CL to keep his nose out of other houses business, especially Violet Wolf. Before he can explain more though, Macmillan does have to leave for his pretend play butler time leaving Ciel to his thoughts for just a moment until he is called on by Clayton. Until Ciel becomes a pretend butler for somebody else, he'll have to clean up the dining hall, a monumental task for our boy here who has never done an ounce of housework in his life. Lucky for him though, he's got his own demon butler who can take care of things here. They debrief on what Ciel has learned about Derek Arden and Ciel makes plans to go find him at the Violet Wolf House, leaving the chores to Sebastian like we knew he would. Ciel shows up at the front gate and is already insulting the place. Dude, Violet Wolf is for the goth baddies. It's got to look like that. Keep your, keep your thoughts to yourself, kid. <laughs> I also think the students here might have heard him though because a horde of them sneak up on him, popping out of the bushes like they're ready for an ambush. Ciel is not welcome here. I honestly want to know if they really are that scary and unsettling or if this is like CL vision and he's just incredibly nervous. <laughs> I could see it. I could see it going either way, honestly. A particular guy with a huge scar across his face and an impressive mohawk confronts CL, asking why he's there and tells him to leave. He does not belong there. Violet Wolf House does not welcome outsiders but they will bully them until they run away crying or whatever. After CL leaves, Violet wanders out, wondering why the students are being so rowdy. The Mohawk guy explains and Violet sees CL running off. More puzzle pieces, perhaps? CL returns to Sapphire Owl House and he's got a serious hurdle in his investigation. Being unable to meet with the headmaster and unable to meet with Derek Arden, He's stuck, and he must figure out a different way to find out the information that he needs. He must gain the favor of the P4. He must become Clayton's pretend butler. Well, he doesn't come to that conclusion right away, but the answer provides itself when Clayton gives him praise for cleaning the dining hall very well. Sebastian went a bit above and beyond, but Ciel realizes that if he butters Clayton up, That'll be his in. So he puts on his ooh-woo persona, really capitalizing on the cuteness of a wee child only 13 years of age, and he lays the seeds for Clayton to feel comfortable making Ciel his pretend butler. The next chapter starts with an illustration of Ciel drowning, bound by several ribbons, in the colored version, this was red ribbons of fate or whatever, Sebastian's hand ready to cut them. To gain his freedom in this miniature garden bound by peculiar rules, Ciel will make whatever cruel decisions necessary. I've brought up before that Black Butler just as a franchise has a lot of imagery of Ciel drowning. It's how he dies in season one. It's something that almost happens to him in the Campania arc. And I think even at the end of season two, and there's two separate illustrations in the Weston arc alone. And there's also this idea that he's drowning in darkness. And there's a few panels in the Green Witch arc, which is after this one, that looks like he's drowning in that darkness and that ink or just 
drowning in the murk. I'm not entirely sure what it means, if it's foreshadowing for him drowning at the end of the series, a metaphor for drowning in the darkness and cruelties that he's experienced, drowning in the sadness and grief that he's struggling with this entire series, but I think this illustration here doubles as a metaphor for struggling through social pretenses and interpersonal drama. The floundering around that's going to school and interacting with your peers, especially as someone who doesn't have a lot of experience socializing. Ciel does not socialize with very many people, and even less so with people his own age. So he's not used to the way that other teens interact, and he's not expecting the petty little mind games that they play. So he struggles, at first at least. We get some more exposition on how Weston operates, details on the other employees at the school and their jobs, and what all is expected of Sebastian as a housemaster. He's also a teacher and a tutor on top of his duties of keeping his house in line. Sebastian really picked the most demanding job, and despite it all, he's gotta pick up CL slack when it comes to his pretend butler duties. Sebastian is lucky that he's a demon who can work quickly and does not need to sleep. He throws a bit of a tantrum about how busy he is, a, a little vent to help him through the day, and then it's back to normal, which honestly I think is so funny. <laughs> this man is just out here throwing different tantrums because he has to do a bit of work. Um, but to be fair, Ciel does ask a lot of him. But also, to be fair, Sebastian's a demon and he can handle it and it's fine. It's whatever. Macmillan has noticed that Ciel has piled a lot of errands for Clayton onto his plate and is amazed that he can get it all done. Ciel shrugs it off though, explaining that there are ways to do things quickly. He's got a trick up of his sleeve. I don't think Macmillan will be able to learn this trick though, but not only is Ciel good at performing tasks for Clayton, he's also brilliant when it comes to his studies. We saw in the previous arc that Sebastian felt Ciel needed to learn to be on par with adults, so I wonder if Ciel is actually ahead of the curriculum at Weston, at least when it comes to the year that he's in, so he's able to ace everything without any problem, leaving him ample time to focus on his investigation. There is also the idea that um, maybe Sebastian's like flubbing his grades, but given how Ciel has been characterized and how we've seen how smart and intelligent he is, I highly doubt that's what's going on. Um, I'm leaning more towards that he's learned all this already before. <laughs> like Millen tells Ciel that the seniors are all talking about him and he'll probably be asked to be someone's personal pretend butler sometime soon. Macmillan thinks Clayton will be the one to ask him, and that is exactly what CL needs. It's for the investigation. At the Swan Gazebo, we see the P4 and their pretend butlers. A pretty boy, Maurice Cole, is the one tending to Redmond. He'll be important, and not just because he slays. <laughs> the P4 are discussing CL, the new boy who's got some talent. Redmond calls Ciel a cutie pie, which is honestly kind of funny because he's right. Ciel would be furious though if he heard that. <laughs> Except for maybe he wouldn't because that's kind of the whole point. But Ciel doesn't, well, Ciel would be angry if someone genuinely felt that about him. Um, unless they were like Lizzie or someone who he feels comfortable being around. It's also funny that Redmond calls Bluer by his first name, only for Bluer to grow a bit annoyed it's against the rules. <laughs> no first names allowed, apparently. It doesn't matter that they're in an isolated place where no one will scold them. Rules are rules, according to Bluer. Redmond has a very laid back personality that we can see here. He's not a huge stickler for the rules and like, it doesn't really matter. Like he's picking his battles more or less. Clayton is asked about his thoughts on Ciel, to which he shares that he thinks Ciel is extraordinary, efficient, and thorough. And he's been able to prepare food in a way that looks and tastes amazing. We see that mohawked guy from earlier, since he's Violet's pretend butler. Violet shares that Ciel came by the Violet Wolf house during the pretend butler time earlier, which would be wild considering he should have been cleaning and the cleaning was clearly done. The P4 wonder why he was dropping by, seeming a tad concerned. 
but they go back to talking about how great Ciel is. That's when Green Hills Pretend Butler speaks up. And he's no other than Edward Midford, our favorite guy. <laughs> he shares that Phantom Hive is his cousin and betrothed to his little sister. Edward mentions that Ciel never told him he enrolled though. Mohawk guy, his name is Cheslock by the way, um, he hasn't formally been introduced yet, but Cheslock is just easier to refer to him as. Cheslock wonders if Ciel hates Edward, since he didn't write a letter or anything, which is kind of funny. Edward tells the group about their trip on the Campania, and Redmond decides to invite Ciel to the gazebo so he can get the whole story. Maurice thinks Ciel sounds amazing, but the rest of the group are wary of inviting him. However, Edward defends his cousin. Ciel will be fine. He can handle himself. He's like a good guy. He can be depended on. And Edward respects Ciel as a man, words he would never actually tell his younger cousin. This testimony convinces the entire group to give Ciel a chance though, so they invite him. But Maurice is the one that volunteers to relay the invitation. Tomorrow at 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Back in Ciel's classroom, the students are in shock that THE Maurice Cole sent for Ciel. Macmillan and his peers usher Ciel to go see him right away. Weston Arc is really a love letter to Shoujo, huh? Just stylistically, or at least Yana is borrowing a lot of Shoujo elements with her page layouts and style. Maurice is really that bitch. He's stunning, beautiful, and holds a lot of social power. He also immediately notices how short Ciel is. Maurice shares that the prefix had been discussing him, and he wanted to invite him out to the gazebo. Tomorrow, at 4 p.m. That's what he tells Ciel. He's done it. He's got an in. Ciel's classmates are really proud of him. I love how eager they are for him, like this new kid who hasn't been here that long and is already making waves. This new kid who's far above the rest, they're jealous, but not the kind of envy that keeps you from hyping people up and sharing in their joy. It's a healthy level of jealousy. Ciel really has a great group of peers in his class, and I so wish he would go to Weston for real after this investigation is over, because I feel like that's the kind of people he needs in his life. That night, Ciel meets with Sebastian. They've got movement in their investigation to discuss, but not before we see that Sebastian is actually capable of being a great and kind teacher. He's so good at working with these kids, and a far cry from the demon Ciel had to train in the flashbacks of the previous arc. Ciel seems to feel some kind of way about it, mentioning that he wished he could show his peers what Sebastian's actual teaching methods were like. A bitter cruelty. He shares with Sebastian the headway that he's made, and requests tea cakes. He's reverting to the unpleasant gremlin that I think many of us knew resided within. Ciel has used up all of his pleasant boy energy. I know he's exhausted from having to be so outwardly kind and social. Even at his best, Ciel is just not outgoing. But he's going to use baked goods to gain the favor of the P4. Sebastian finds it funny that he can win hearts with food as opposed to money, something that's very different in the world Ciel usually resides in. Sebastian has his teaching duties though, coaching cricket, and at the time of the meeting, at that, but he does still offer to be on standby. But Ciel is certain he'll be fine on his own. I mean, it's just a group of teenagers, how bad can it really be? He orders Sebastian to make something that'll knock their socks off. An actual command. I love how low stakes and frivolous this arc is. Fast forward to 4 p.m. the next day. Ciel shows up to a group of very upset people, accusing him of being two hours late, which is so rude. Everyone is pissed, rightfully so, and angry that they vouched for him. Angry that they trusted him. Ciel's chances have been effectively ruined. Maurice, who told him 4 p.m., claims that he didn't, actually, and that Ciel must be mistaken. Edward is incredibly disappointed with him, which I think is worse than everyone else being upset with him. Maurice tricked him, but they will not take excuses. Ciel is told to get out, 
and he's been locked out of his only lead. Back at the house, Ciel is having a venting tantrum to Sebastian, and to be honest, that invitation should have been on paper, not just verbal. Ciel hates verbal arrangements, and he's so real for that. It's hard to keep verbal arrangements straight, even when there's not a snake trying to trick you. Sebastian points out that this kind of envy is pretty typical of humans, and Ciel shouldn't be a stranger towards this envy being thrown his way. He also wants to know if Ciel patched things up with his cousin, but Ciel claims such explanations would not work with Edward. And he did in fact break the appointment, taking some form of responsibility. Good for him. Sebastian asks if he'll take the L, crying himself to sleep, but Ciel is not like that. Not when it comes to this low stakes petty behavior. No, he can dish it right back out. Ciel will gain the P4's favor, and he will make Maurice Cole rue the day he chose to pick a fight with Ciel Phantom Hive. So the main drama of this arc, or at least the first half of the arc, is shaping up to be some traditional schoolboy fun. You know, the typical overanalyzing to find out information that you can use to dig up blackmail for those who have wronged you. I don't know, I wasn't a boy in school. Ciel has noticed that Maurice Cole's hands are perfect. A little too perfect. Usually, a student who was a pretend butler for another would have blisters or calluses or just some sign of work from the chores that they do. Cole also lied with so little effort. He's also using dirty tricks just like Ciel. Sebastian is so real for calling him out like that. I hate to side with the demon, but here we are. Sebastian teases Ciel, saying he should have been able to sniff Cole out. This man is so petty. <laughs> However, just knowing the kind of person Cole is is not enough. They need hard proof to give the boy his comeuppance. I think that's the first time I've ever actually said the word comeuppance. I read it a lot. I've never said it before. To find this evidence, though, Sebastian must stalk the boy and find others who have fallen victim. And Ciel is now subject to negative gossip. His peers are talking about how he skipped out on the P4 meeting, which is such a wild thing. And like, why would he do that? That's like social suicide, what is going through this man's head? Kind of vibes. Um, Maurice Cole, though, has everyone wrapped around his pretty little finger. He's charming and uses his charms to manipulate those around him into doing his bidding, dangling the promise of appointing someone his pretend butler. Redmond and the other P4 are amazed at how quickly Cole is able to get his work done and wonder how he's able to do such complicated stuff every day. Cole is just built different. However, Maurice Cole's empire will soon crumble down. Every empire has its lifespan his included. Sebastian has a run-in with a Scarlet Fox student at the library, a shy boy who is very intelligent, Joanne Harcourt, a second year. Through some guided conversation, Sebastian gets the student into a confessional, where he soon learns all he needs to know about Maurice Cole. Maurice Cole had lied, of course, about sending Harcourt an invitation to the Swan Gazebo, hiding it in Harcourt's desk, so that when Harcourt claimed to have never received it, the evidence would say otherwise. Harcourt was made out to be a liar, and no one wants to be friends with a liar. Maurice Cole essentially ruined Harcourt's reputation and basically ruined his ability to make friends. Prior to this, Sebastian had been able to confirm three other students who were also victims of Cole's wiles. However, further investigation would be difficult without an inside man. Someone Ciel could trust, and someone who trusted Ciel. Someone with the wealth and status to be placed in Scarlet Fox, but he doesn't know anyone, does he? A trusting person that Ciel can also trust that also has wealth and status, and is also um, a, a guy because technically Lizzie would fall under that. <laughs> um, who do we know that fits that description? 
Well, Ciel and Sebastian realize at the same time that they know exactly one person who satisfies the requirements, but they are reluctant to call on him. Before we find out who they're talking about though, the scene shifts to Ciel's bedtime, pretty much. Well, past it, since everyone is already in bed, but Macmillan needs to speak with him. Macmillan wants to apologize for being a bad friend, for not sticking up for Ciel at school to save his own skin. It's honestly a really cute scene, and despite knowing how one-sided this friendship is, part of me still hopes that Ciel feels some kind of semblance of friendship here. I know he doesn't, but please let me be delusional because he deserves a friend like Macmillan. Macmillan wants to understand why Ciel did what everyone thinks he did. He opens up the conversation, ready to hear him out. Ciel explains how the meeting was actually at two, despite being told four, and Macmillan remembers hearing four as well. He's shocked at what's happened, and is ready to defend his new friend. If Macmillan's word is not enough, then he'll ask for other witnesses to come forward. Macmillan is ready to stand up for Ciel, especially now that he knows Ciel didn't do anything wrong and he was in fact wronged himself. This new support is something Ciel had not accounted for, but it will work well for his plans. He smiles, a devious smile, at least that's how this panel is read, and it's hard to claim otherwise no matter how badly I want to, but hey, things are working out. The next morning, things are getting a little wild at Weston College. Someone has arrived via elephant? Sure, why not? If you hadn't guessed by now, Prince Soma is the person Ciel had to call upon to help with the investigation. Quite literally, his only friend that he's not related to that fit the bill. And he's just so happy to be here. I, I love Soma so much. Soma is very excited to see Ciel, calling out to him from atop the elephant, but our antisocial king is so embarrassed by this, and he just turns to walk away. He also hoped that Soma would pretend to be a stranger to him, but Soma would never pass up a chance to say hello to his bestie. So in spite of Ciel's cold shoulder, Soma somehow has the elephant pick Ciel up with its trunk. They're so besties. Cousin, sibling coded, whatever. Soma is going to say hello to his weird 13 year old friend, and Ciel is going to have to deal with his weird older cousin friend. They're so silly. I love how at this point in their friendship, Ciel will do something that would normally hurt Soma's feelings, but Soma knows that Ciel is just like that, so he adapts, brushing it off and finding a different way to share his friendly affection with the cold shoulder. <laughs> Ciel is regretting asking Soma to come to school. <laughs> Prince Soma is now here to get an education, but he's had to leave Agni behind. You can't bring your servants to school, and Agni is so, so sad about it. These two are very special to me. Ciel tells Soma that he's been fighting with Maurice Cole, and he needed his cool friend to come help with that. And Soma is always down to help his gloomy and self-deprecating fella. Soma offers to set up a curry dinner between the three of them because Ciel has told him he wants to make friends with Cole. But Ciel is a liar. He just needs Soma to stalk Cole and relay all the information that he can. He can't tell Soma the real truth that he's just here to investigate and Cole was being a little sneaky cheater and ruining the investigation so now he has to investigate Cole's sneaky cheating lying ways. However, since Soma believes that Ciel just wants to be friends, he's taking a more direct approach. In true Soma fashion, he's just going to try and talk it out, or tell Cole to make nice with Ciel, because he doesn't realize what's actually going on here. I love Soma so much, I really do. But in what world, in what world would this work? The guy drives Maurice Cole mad. Funnily enough, Soma sees this outburst and it reminds him of Ciel. He's so silly. And after being reminded of his best friend, he decides to pay Ciel a visit. But not before going to get his elephant. 
This backfires and causes a scene, crashing into the Scarlet Fox dorm house. Whenever Soma gets involved, the story just becomes even more so, less serious, and honestly, I'm here for it. After driving Maurice Cole insane, Soma then crashed his elephant into the dorms. What a turn of events. And instead of letting Redmond find a place for Cole to stay, Soma takes responsibility and offers up his room, sleeping on the floor so Cole has a bed. This is how Soma finds out that Cole gets up in the middle of the night and leaves little notes for other students on rose-shaped paper. How cute! Also remember the no servants rule that stopped Agni from coming along? Well, Soma recognizes Sebastian right away, and he's so jealous. It's honestly really funny. <laughs> anyway, with this new piece of information, Ciel has a lead now on gaining concrete proof that Maurice Cole is a no good, dirty little lying snake. After thinking Soma, Ciel and Sebastian make a plan. The very next day, Ciel corners Cole. A meeting in the third art room. Ciel has all of his ducks in a row. 18 witnesses had confirmed that Cole did in fact say 4 p.m was the time for Ciel to meet with the prefix. However, Ciel goes one step further, calling that a mistake would be wrong. Cole lied on purpose. However, he has supporting evidence thanks to Joanne Harcourt. Each of the students who had missed their appointments at the Swan Gazebo each cited communication issues with Cole as the reason. Ciel assumes it's an attempt to cut down competition. Maurice Cole is a coward who is unable to trust in his own abilities and standing. However, he's not really standing on his own now, is he? His competence is a scam. Sial calls him out for delegating his duties to others. Yeah, we're gonna ignore the hypocrisy here. At least Sial actually does the work himself for Funtum and some of the investigations for the queen, so like he gets a pass. Cole, not realizing the extent as to which he had been had, continues to deny, deny, deny. Ciel is throwing around serious accusations. However, Ciel whips out one of those rose-shaped papers taped back together revealing the schemes. The mask slips off. The nasty fellow beneath is starting to be revealed. Maurice Cole's world is crumbling beneath his feet. The pawns he'd gathered were no longer useful. Phantom Hive and his butler have been able to topple down the fragile empire that Cole was building. Ciel has dozens of notes painstakingly picked from the trash and pieced back together by Sebastian, obviously. Ciel was kind of wild for that, and the fact that it looks like he did it himself is even wilder in Cole's perspective. Like, Phantom Hive just looks like an insane guy. <laughs> Which, maybe he is in a way. Ciel tries to naively appeal to Cole's better nature, however, there is none to be found. Cole is not the kind-hearted, hard-working guy he pretends to be. He doesn't care about morality or shame, all he cares about is how others perceive him, and how he can gain something from that. He won't talk to Redmond about it, instead, he's got another plan. With the snap of a finger, Cole calls in students to rough Ciel up, silence him, and scare him into submission. Cole burns the evidence. He's grown irritated with this little phantom hive kid, the little brat who's gotten a superiority complex because the upperclassmen like him. I mean, yes, but that's not why Ciel has a superiority complex. I think that comes from the all-powerful demon that's at his side at all times, but Cole doesn't need to know about that. <laughs> Cole defends himself, stating that manipulating others is a talent as well, and he sure is good at it. He's beautiful and he knows it. He uses that to his advantage. However, him becoming a prefect in his eyes will make or break his future. His entire life is riding on him becoming a prefect. He thinks that he must flatter the current prefix, making himself out to be perfect in order to secure his future. In Cole's eyes, Ciel is nothing but a brat who already has a title and he has nothing to work for. He'd never understand the struggles of being a second son. Except he does? It's not explicitly canon in the English translations at this point, but also it kind of is. Ciel is not who he says he is, and there was a twin. 
All of this has been alluded to pretty clearly, or at least pretty clearly in hindsight, and honestly, the look on this face says it all. Who is Cole to make assumptions about what Ciel does and does not know? Who is he to look down on him? Who is he to deceive others and obtain the power necessary? Who is Cole to do the very thing that Ciel has done? Yes, what Cole is doing at Weston is vile, and he's screwing up other people's lives as well, using them and tossing others to the side like they're nothing more than pawns. However, I think part of why this is so enraging to Ciel is because a lot of what he's calling Cole out for doing, he's doing himself. Taking Sebastian's work on as his own, lying about who he is to gain power, deceiving others for his gain. Sure, it's not the same and Ciel isn't abusing and manipulating innocent people like Cole was, but I think Ciel thinks that he is much worse of a person than he really is, so in his little 13-year-old mind, this is all the same. We are our own worst critics after all, and that's true for Ciel as well. He continues to call Cole out though, stating that there is no value in a victory obtained by deceit. I'm fairly certain that this is just something he's saying for his image, and not something he truly believes, considering the fact that he deceives people all the time, and doesn't really care, or at least doesn't seem to care. Uh, the ends justify the means, or whatever. He lies to Soma without second thought all of the time. In fact, every time he has seen Soma in this arc, he is tricking him into obtaining information for Ciel's very own victory against Maurice Cole. But Ciel's performing right now. The act of the good boy, the opposite of Maurice Cole. This makes Cole sick provoking him to outrage and escalating the situation. I'm pretty sure it was a pre-planned escalation though, but Ciel is now actually in danger. I don't like the way Cole is swinging those scissors around. This silly schoolboy story is not looking so silly anymore. <laughs> Ciel's clothes are being torn off for, um, pictures? Cole doesn't specify, but he does say the pictures will be the embarrassing kind that will make Ciel want to die. That mixed with the ripping of his clothes makes me think they were going to do something that's, um, not entirely legal, um, and severely uncomfortable. Not entirely sure how dark Yana Tabosa was thinking these guys would get, but it's a setup for a deeply, deeply uncomfortable situation, and one that could potentially be triggering for CL and the readers alike. However, before things go further, help arrives. Greenhill and Edward bust in, cricket bat swinging. Greenhill is pissed, and Cole was going to pay for making him break his vow of non-violence. So is Greenhill a bit of a pacifist? Or is this a, I've committed atrocities, now I'm trying to be better and do better kind of vow? Only time will tell. Maurice Cole has been had, though. For real this time. There are witnesses to his cruelties. Bluer and Violet are also on the scene. Ciel had this all planned out. This kid is just too smart. He studied his physics and set up a really cool string can phone kind of deal. The prefix were able to overhear Cole's transgressions and rushed over to help Ciel when it sounded like things were escalating. And Redman heard every word. I also love that, um, Edward rushed over, but none of the other prefix pretend butlers did, or at least he's the only one present in this whole scene. Edward is also the one that rushed up to help CL, like help him get up and like, cover himself, and that's just proof he cares about his cousin uh, more than he lets on, but also like, I do think whatever CL like genuinely felt about the situation, obviously he knew that he wasn't completely on his own, there were the whole thing with the prefix and in the worst case scenario Sebastian would show up so I think he knew he wasn't genuinely in danger but also at the same time like he's being compromised and I think having someone like Edward someone that he's always been able to trust and depend on was probably like a great deal of comfort regardless of how shaken up he really was in this situation. 
Redmond is now aware of the deceit and betrayal. He's ashamed that he's been fooled. He is disappointed in Cole's actions, and he will not hear Cole out. He's heard enough. There's no excuses. It's over. Cole is over. But Ciel extends a friendly hand. If Cole was more honest, he could regain people's trust. His life wouldn't be over. However, we know Ciel has a mean streak, and it's not that simple. He's helping Cole be more upfront and honest by exposing his beauty routine, spreading pictures of him applying false lashes and exposing that even his looks were nothing more than a fabrication. Maurice Cole is as fake as they come. It's so over for this guy. Edward apologizes to Ciel, making amends. Things are really looking up here. The prefix admires Ciel's action and the way he shakes things up and his bravery. All of these things are actually true to Ciel's character as well, even if they may not realize the full extent. He's a silly little guy. He gets things done and he is so, so brave. Ciel faces the horrors on a regular and he's still pushing through. He's experienced things that I think a lot of people would not be able to come back from, but he's braving the world despite its cruelties. But of course, he's got to lie and put on the cute, innocent boy persona that he's using to charm those around him at Weston. It's for the sake of the investigation. In some ways, Ciel is not all that different from Maurice Cole. They both lie, misrepresent themselves, and manipulate those around them to get what they want. Only difference is, Ciel is the main character here, and we know that he doesn't actually have malicious intent, and it's framed as something that he has to do for the investigation, it's for the greater good. He's only doing what he must to survive and carry out his duties. And Sebastian knows Ciel is totally full of shit. Back in Good Graces, Ciel is now appointed the pretend butler for Clayton. His plan of infiltrating the P4 is working, and it's working so well. Things are looking great for him in this investigation. I do want to talk about how formal and serious this process is. Ciel and Clayton are in a hall of sorts, and it's really dramatic. It feels less like Ciel is taking on a role of personal errand boy and more so devoting his life to Clayton, even showing him mirroring the bowed pose that Sebastian often takes with him. From my knowledge of where the story goes after this, I don't think this necessarily means anything in regards of Ciel and Clayton's relationship, but more so, it's to put Weston's traditions in a light that shows that it is that serious for many at this school. We saw that with the conflict with Maurice Cole, and it's reinforced with the serious and dramatic tone of Ciel accepting the role of Clayton's pretend butler. Stories revolving around school life typically feel pretty frivolous and not that deep, but Black Butler as a whole always has that dramatic darkness clinging to the story and the characters. Frivolous storylines end up turning out to be that deep or not actually frivolous to begin with and West is no exception. Things are going according to plan though, and Ciel is feeling secure in his role. The rest of his peers seem to be over the moon too. I really love how supportive his classmates are. They're excited to share in his joy and to celebrate his accomplishments. It's an environment I so wish Ciel would have lived in, or like, I don't know, had the opportunity to thrive in, in better, more normal conditions. <laughs> Ciel is making quite the stir in the social setting of Weston. Even the other houses know of him now, which gives Soma plenty of opportunity to see his friend seemingly thrive, and that's so great. I also think it's cute that Soma thinks Ciel is making friends despite his sour nature, instead of the truth that Ciel is just masking and putting on a performance, hiding his more negative personality traits most of the time. However, as much as this is a performance, I do think that there is a level of authenticity here with CL. We all put on performances in public settings in order to have an easier time or to get people to like us to some degree. It's very human. Um, 
or maybe it's just the autism, but I, I do believe it's very human. It's something that we all do regardless of neurodivergencies. Ciel is also incredibly introverted. So even if he was just being himself, it would still be incredibly exhausting and maybe start to feel like a big show he was putting on for others. I'm not sure where my introverted tendencies end though and um, where autism begins so that be aware that is clouding my perspective here. So maybe what I thought was just being introverted and trying to appease public spaces is actually just autistic masking. Either way, Ciel is going to be exhausted after a long day of playing nice. And even if he says it feels like he's an actor putting on a performance, which in a way he is, um, I think there's a level of himself in that performance. And I'll be the first to admit, I am out here pushing an agenda. Ciel is a sweet, sweet little boy when he wants to be as much as he is a sneaky little conniving piece of shit. He's also kind-hearted and cares a lot about others. If he were going to Weston for real and trying to make friends instead of investigating, I don't think he would put on this cute uwu persona as heavily, and he totally would not want to be Clayton's pretend butler, but he would care about getting things done in a way that satisfies him. Maybe not quite a perfectionist, but Ciel cares about the quality of his work. He'd still work hard, even if he wasn't as openly kind and sociable. I think he'd also still be friends with Macmillan, but more so Macmillan would befriend him as the new kid and Ciel would just tolerate him until he grew a soft spot, much like how his friendship with Soma came about. But this is all hypothetical. Ciel is currently playing a role to get information for the Queen, and even though his performances are stunning, He's, and he's gained everything socially, he still lacks information. Sure, he appears to have the school wrapped around his finger, but he still needs to find out what's going on with Derek Arden and the other missing students who seem to have shut themselves in, breaking contact with their families and the outside world. Ciel and Sebastian have been unable to lay eyes on any of these students. It's a very abnormal situation, and it's very clear that even the Queen has realized that this is not normal teen rebellion. There's something more serious and odd going on at Weston, and it's up to Ciel to get to the bottom of it. Even if that means navigating arbitrary rules and getting into good graces with the prefix, people he normally wouldn't care that much about. Those who enforce the rules. However, he is still um, a bit removed from the prefix and their illicit midnight tea party. The goalposts are in sight, but still out of reach. Instead of aiming to meet with the headmaster directly at this time, he figured he would start asking questions to those who might actually have answers. And Violet is the prefect who should have the most answers, right? Seeing as Derek Arden was moved to his house, right? At the Swan Gazebo, Ciel is hanging out with the prefix and their pretend butlers. I really love these moments of downtime in this arc because they go a long way to characterize these guys and their dynamics. They're just vibing, having a good time, as teenagers should. They're friends, they mess with one another, they have silly rivalries, and they're just hanging out. The group starts discussing the school's yearly tournament, and how the students get restless and lose their composure the closer it gets to the tournament which takes place on June 4th, something Ciel doesn't know about, which means he and the reader get to be filled in together. A cricket tournament, the only sport that has been mentioned in Black Butler, or at least in the Western arc. Black Butler gets to go on its sports anime arc. Yes, Weston was coming out around the same time that sports anime were having a bit of a boom. How could you tell? This arc was being published around 2012 to 2013, which was during or at the start of that boom. I wasn't super involved in online communities during this time, so I can't speak with utmost certainty, but there's a bit of overlap in communities here. Black Butler has always had a strong Fujoshi fan base, and so did the sports anime that came out around this time and slightly after. I know Fujoshi is typically referred to 
as um, or it's typically used to refer to straight women fetishizing gay men in fiction. Um, but I don't know what other word to use here, even though that's not exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not just talking about that stereotype. I I know plenty of that fan base and like the group of people I'm talking about are also a part of the LGBT community. So they're not straight women fetishizing gay men. They're often gay men themselves or non-binary people or just queer people in general seeking queer representation wherever they can get it. At least that's what it was like in my personal circle and the people I tend to meet who are in these groups. There was, you can't deny there was an overlap between like these sports animes like Free, Kuroko no Baskets, Haikyuu, and the shipping fandom culture and Black Butler and all that. Like we, they were, if they weren't the same people, they were at least friends. That's, that's the space that Weston was coming out in or like right before. I just feel like that's very important because as Black Butler goes on, or I guess as we catch up to eras that I was able to personally witness when it comes to trends within anime, it becomes very easy to see where Yana Toboso takes inspiration from what is trending and popular in anime and manga communities. This will come up again when we talk about the boy band arc during the idol era. <laughs> It is really fun to be able to pick up on all the pop culture references in Black Butler because this sports anime arc is not the only instance of Yana Toboso utilizing really popular elements of anime and manga within Black Butler. It's really neat and it also kind of dates the story arcs in a way that I find fascinating. I will always know that Weston came out in the early 2010s and I'll always know that the Blue Cult arc came out in the like mid to late 2010s because Love Live, Idol Era. We'll talk about that more when we get to that arc. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. The group explains to CL about the cricket tournament and how big of a deal it is. We get fun insight into everyone's personalities here. Cheslock's aggression, Violet's tendency to keep things to himself and being uncomfortable with crowds, Redmond's excitement for parties and women. <laughs> He's real for that, but I also find it funny because I know a lot of fans would look at that man and many others at Weston and not see a man that likes women. Bisexual or pansexual at best if women are involved? Not that it matters, I just find it funny when a piece of media tries to imply straightness when the audience will most likely ignore that, or as an attempt to erase any queerness in the story. Not that that's what's going on here, but it's a little amusing. We also learned that Bluer has a lot of sisters, which is funny because Redmond is teasing him about being around a lot of women during these yearly celebrations, leaving out the fact that they are his sisters and not women that he's courting. This does lead Cheslock and Edward to talk about their own sisters, which we know Edward loves and adores Lizzie. It's cute, actually, and it seems that even at school, Edward will not keep his chill when it comes to the weird competition he has with Ciel in terms of Lizzie and her affection. Redmond is also kind of weird and asking how much intimacy Ciel and Lizzie have engaged in. Ciel is... 13 years old. I think Lizzie is 14 or 15, but Ciel is 13 years old. It's a weird thing to ask in general, considering that Redmond and Ciel are not even that close. Um, but also, Lizzie's older brother is right there? Is that not a weird thing to bring up? Like, if, if I had a friend who was, I don't know, engaged to my brother and... Another one of my friends was like, hey, what are, like, what kind of, what kind of stuff do you get up to with Mel's brother? Like, I don't want to be around for that conversation. That's weird. Redmond, read the room. <laughs> with all this lighthearted conversation, though, and talks of rivalries, Ciel decides now is the perfect time to ask about Derek Arden, leading with the notion that he has friends in other houses. And honestly, this, like, also leads to a conversation where Harcourt is like, oh, I consider you a friend, and Ciel's like, oh, I consider you a friend too, even though we know Ciel is lying. It's still cute to see Harcourt be like, OMG besties. <laughs> as soon as Ciel utters Derek Arden's name, though, everyone freezes. Ciel has effectively ruined the vibe. 
I imagine it went dead silent here too. The anime better cut the soundtrack for dramatic tension here. Violet is the first to speak, an intense look on his face, asking if CL just said Derek Arden. Something is definitely up here. With the vibes ruined, Ciel is left wondering why the P4 reacted so strongly. However, their play butlers don't seem phased. Edward expresses shock that Ciel knew Arden. Ciel makes up a story about how they played together when he was younger. I say makeup because I don't think Ciel has ever met Derek Arden before, but he needs a story as to how he knows the guy because he can't just say he's investigating Arden's, Arden's disappearance. Ciel continues to talk about Arden, expressing surprise that he'd been transferred to Violet Wolf. He asks what it was that Arden excelled at, since Violet Wolf took in students who were good in the arts. However, everyone had a different, conflicting answer. Almost as if they didn't actually know him, or Arden's story was a cover-up of sorts. Ciel comes to this conclusion as well. It's odd to him how much emphasis is put on tradition and the headmaster's will being absolute, something the P4 turned to to explain why they don't really know why Arden was transferred. During this conversation, Violet also drew this sick piece of what looks like Ciel being grasped by a monster. I know this has got to mean something. The monster of curiosity the monster that Derek Arden may have been all along it's too soon to tell but it feels like an omen of sorts Ciel is able to essentially hound Edward for answers though and they meet up to talk later Edward knows about Ciel's position as the Queen's watchdog so if he raises any suspicion Edward will know what's up and that doesn't really matter because Edward is smart <laughs> And he knows that if Ciel is here and, like, investigating, then, like, it's something that's a big deal, he should keep it to himself. Which is good. Because Edward did figure out that that's exactly what's going on. So, <laughs> I love that for them. Edward reveals that there were a number of students who transferred from Scarlet Fox to Violet Wolf around the same time. But since he doesn't know much about other houses, he's not really sure as to why. And he also does not know their names but it is still an important detail. No worries about the lack of information from Edward though. Our resident gossip king, Macmillan, knows who transferred houses. Again, there's the notion of curiosity is odd and it's not worth wondering about since the headmaster's will is absolute, but Macmillan does speculate that the transfer was done to balance out the houses since apparently Violent Wolf students are prone to dropping out. Sure sounds more like a stereotype since they're characterized as the weird emo art kids, um, but either way, Ciel has the names of these people and he can confirm that the missing students are in fact the students that were randomly swapped to Violet Wolf House. Violet House. Purple House. McMillan is so cute though. He doesn't really care to talk about these people. He'd rather hear about Ciel and what Ciel has done and accomplished and what hanging out with the P4 was like. This kid is such a fan of the prefix. Literally, people he goes to school with. However, Ciel shuts down the conversation pretty quickly and leaves, presumably to run an errand. But he thinks to himself that he can't waste time with these kids. He's already, like, wasted enough time. He's ready to be done with this whole investigation. I think he's already stayed longer than he had intended. He doesn't particularly enjoy undercover work, especially when it puts him being away from home for an extended period of time. He's a homebody, and I can't blame him. Me too. Xiao does find another group of students he can grill for information, all met with different descriptions of what Arden was known for, and the same answer as to why he was transferred. Who knows? It was the headmaster's decision, right? This almost makes Weston feel like a hive mind of sorts. They're all sheep following the headmaster without question, something Ciel is highly critical of. He seems to be a bit disgusted about it, which, fair, Ciel is an outsider, and with his outsider perspective on all this, 
And what we've seen of his character and how he was raised, it makes sense for Ciel to value individuality and thinking for oneself. Sebastian is also asking questions about Derek Arden under the guise of being worried about a student who is not showing up to class. A very normal thing for a teacher to be concerned about, and the headmaster's decision not being questioned seems to be a similar theme amongst the staff. Or at least with uh, Mr. Aguirre's, our silly goofy guy who keeps taking tumbles, the vice headmaster. It's also important to note that Violet is seen overhearing this conversation. He knows people are asking questions. All of these weird encounters are adding up though, and Sebastian needs to meet with Ciel, but they also need to avoid being caught. So we get a little bit of fan service. Honestly, Black Butler has fan service sprinkled all throughout it, so it was about time we got some in the Western arc. The two meet up in the library, and after a close encounter with Bluer, it becomes clear that Ciel was being followed. The prefects are starting to catch on, wondering what he's up to and how much he knows, but he knows nothing. Sebastian and Ciel both got the same answers, which basically amounts to nothing. It's looking more likely that they won't make any progress in this investigation until they come face to face with Derek Garden themselves. So Stiel comes up with a plan. He sneaks out and heads to the Violet Wolf house. We don't know what time it is, but it is the middle of the night. Sebastian wonders how he'll plan to get inside and teases Stiel about relying on Sebastian's powers. But Stiel is one step ahead or in the moment, decides to do something himself to spite the demon. He starts a fire. Ciel, in a rare feat of athleticism, is able to toss his lantern into the Violet Wolf dormitory, smashing a window and catching the drapes on fire. It's a rule that in case of an emergency, such as a fire, all students must vacate the building. It's a smart plan on Ciel's part, and a good way to see if Derek Arden is even on campus. And if he's not, then that's progress in the investigation at least. Or Derek has chosen to die in the fire, which also feels like some sort of progress in the investigation. Or a secret third option, which if you know how the story arc ends, then you know what I'm alluding to here. I know most people watching this video have likely already read the Western arc, but I'm being coy for the simple fact that I have a couple of friends who pretty much only consume Black Butler through me info dumping about it, and they have not read past the Campania arc, so this is all new information for them. So <laughs> we'll just keep going. Anyway, Ciel commits arson and is now very excited to meet Derek Arden. This child is ready to wrap up the investigation and return to the comforts of his home and the familiarity of the Three Rings Circus that is the Phantom Hive household. The Violet Wolf students rush out of the dormitory with Cheslock helping get everyone out. Well, by helping I mean yelling, but he seems to be taking a bit of leadership in this crisis. Sebastian uses his demon eyes to locate Derek Arden and the other missing students, but none of them are in the crowd. They wait, though, seeing if any of these guys were stragglers. The room captains do a roll call to make sure everyone is out. There's a moment where we seem to focus on Violet. He looks like a wet cat here. And I think out of all of the prefix, he is the one we're supposed to sympathize with the most. He's often framed as being incredibly disturbed, and maybe it's a hint or a red herring of sorts. We get a close-up on his face as the fire rages on and reflects through his eyes. This is usually done in manga to convey some sort of emotion, trauma, or memory. We can't say which it is here just yet, but this is something that clearly has Violet shaken up. Ciel is growing concerned. Derek and the others still have not left, and the dormitory is on fire. But when he demands Sebastian to go save them, Sebastian hesitates. Then states that there are no traces of living souls in the dorm. Everyone who was in it is now outside, meaning that Derek and the other missing students 
were never inside Violet Wolf Dormitory. They don't reside there. The other prefix and their pretend butlers are seen running up to Violet, asking if everyone is alright. He states that everyone is here, as he pulls up his hood. Everyone is out. More confirmation that Derek Arden and the other missing students were never actually in Violet Wolf, and Violet knew that. He is in on something. Ciel is starting to piece things together. The P4 are hiding something. It's not just Violet, but the whole group. I do think it's interesting how up until this very moment, there seemed to be hints that Violet was the main one hiding something, only for Ciel to state that it's the entire group. Sure, the rest of the group was a little suspicious with Bluer following Ciel, but Violet's been the main suspicious one. Violet's been the one lurking around corners and seeming to notice more about Ciel poking his nose in places he shouldn't be. After coming to this conclusion, Ciel states that letting this whole debacle continue is pointless, and they need to put the fire out now. So Sebastian does what he does best. He picks a really showy method that draws him all the attention he craves, while also keeping within the realm of possibility for a human man. He brings Soma's elephant, carrying buckets of water on its trunk to help put out the fire. I do love that the elephant that Soma brought to school has been a reoccurring problem causer and or solver. It's like, this is a reoccurring character of sorts. The whole school comes together to put out the fire, but Violet doesn't want their help. He wants them to stay out of Violet House, almost as if he doesn't want them to find something or is holding on to tradition and pride? Either way, Soma is not having it. He retorts back that Violet is supposed to be a leader and that he can't protect his people if he is letting his pride get in the way. And that if he can't protect his people, then he is a bad leader. Which, yeah, if you're willing to just let those that you're in charge of lose their home to a fire because you refused help, that does make you a dumb and prideful leader who should not be in a leadership position. This seems to strike something within Violet and he folds, telling Cheslock that it's fine when he tried to defend him against Soma and accepting the help in the end. But he still seems a bit shaken or upset about all of this. Soma's words resonated in some way that will probably come back up again, or at least make more sense in the future. Cheslock promises that Soma will pay for the disrespect, but most importantly, the students at Weston are learning fire safety and working together to put out the flames. It's kind of wild that the only adult here seems to be Sebastian. Like, where, where's the housemaster for Violet Wolf? What about the other housemasters? Surely there's some faculty on campus who have heard the commotion, but I assume those are all unnamed, unimportant characters that we don't need to see on the page. Post-fire, the students at Weston seem to be spreading rumors that it was an act of arson, which is true, I guess? And they're worried that the act of arson will cause the cricket tournament to be cancelled. Ciel's classmate discussed the likelihood of this and also mentioned that the headmaster will be attending the tournament, just as Ciel is coming to the conclusion that his only lead in this investigation is making direct contact with the headmaster. How convenient. So it's looking like the cricket tournament that was mentioned a couple chapters ago is actually going to be a pretty important after all. Macmillan doesn't seem to think that Sapphire Owls have any chance of winning. I mean, it's the house of nerds, right? The odds are stacked against them, but he says that they must try extra hard on their cheering. Showing sportsmanship and support is important, I guess. Macmillan also mentions that even though Sapphire Owl always comes in dead last, everyone still has an equal opportunity to be invited to the midnight tea party. This piques CL's interest, since that's seeming to be the only way he can contact the busy headmaster and actually end this investigation. Macmillan explains that the headmaster invites the most valuable player, so MVPs get invited despite how well their house did. Which is great news for Ciel. Well, maybe. He doesn't have to win, but he also has to make sure he is somehow 
the one who shows the most outstanding effort during the tournament out of all four of the houses. Which, if I know CL, I know that'll be hard for him to do honestly. Love that kid, but he just isn't athletic, nor is he sporty or a personality hire. He can't do this on ability alone, and it would take a miracle for his vibes to be enough to make a difference. But he still has a chance, and that's something. That's a lead. A, a way in? However, it's not clear-cut and simple. There's not one thing that Ciel can set as a goal here. McMillan explains that the reasons for picking MVP seem to be different pretty much every year, and overall the theme is pretty subjective. The play that is most befitting of a gentleman. Yeah, I don't know what that means. CL doesn't know what that means. We're both at a loss here. But first things first, Ciel has to secure a spot on the cricket team for his house. There's only 11 players per team. Luckily for Ciel though, I think the rest of Sapphire Owl are equally as unqualified to play cricket. And the suspicion is confirmed on the next page when Clayton comes up to tell Ciel that he's on the team. They don't look for a constitution, there's no athletics check here, but instead Sapphire Owl's cricket team is made up of strategizers, intelligence and perhaps wisdom working together to try and outsmart their opponents. It's a great idea since they know overall they lack physical ability and the that the other houses can count on pretty much. And Ciel has already proven himself as clever with the whole Maurice Cole debacle, but it also helps that Sebastian put in a good word for him. Also, Ciel loathes to compliment Sebastian. Their dynamic is so funny. They hate each other, but they need each other for now. And icing on top of the cake, Ciel has to make a public display of thanks towards this demon. I know Ciel was screaming and crying on the inside over this. I can't wait to see this animated. <laughs> the two have a coded conversation about how Sebastian will help Ciel out with preparations, once his schoolwork is complete though, because he's merely a tutor. They didn't add in the one hell of a joke here. Like he's not one hell of a tutor, he's just a tutor. <laughs> Must make a better butler or something. Ciel and Sebastian must find a way to be the most outstanding, gentlemanly student at the entire tournament. They must win and move everyone to tears in the process. Ciel's cooking an evil plan, one that Sebastian is looking forward to. Or at least, he's looking forward to seeing Ciel put on one hell of a show. Fast forward to June 3rd, the day before the big tournament. It's time to set the scene! In the grand dining hall, students and their families are mingling and enjoying the festivities. It's also time to introduce each of the cricket teams. It's a huge deal and each team gets a special entrance. Green Lion, Knights of the Cricket Field, their overwhelming physical prowess. Scarlet Fox, elegant and perhaps a hair flirtatious, the theatrical guys of the cricket field. Violet Wolf, the unsettling and unpredictable ghosts of the cricket field. And finally, Sapphire Owl, the strategic and different smart boys of the cricket field. Entrances that match the base personality of each house in case you forgot who these guys were. Entrances that may tell us what to expect from each team in the tournament. And each team, as per tradition, solemnly swears to fight fair and square. Nobody tells Ciel that he promised not to cheat. It's now time for the Interhouse Cricket Tournament of 1889. The Vice Headmaster is back at it again with those weird tumbles that he just brushes off pretty much every time he is seen. There's just something off about him. He's always tripping. Everyone is enjoying the company they don't see as often, family, friends, new faces. It's a nice celebration that most people are reveling in, except for Bluer who wants to talk strategies with his team, but his family has other plans, and that includes showing Ciel a lot of attention, the thing he hates the most. 
I'm not sure if the Midfords overheard Bluer's sisters trying to marry their younger sister off to Ciel, but Lizzie does approach them, introducing herself as his fiance, and Edward is angry that Ciel was seen speaking with other women. Or maybe angry that he wasn't hanging out with Lizzie? Either way. <laughs> Scarlet Fox comes up and we get to learn Soma's history with Cricket. Ciel is shocked and perhaps a bit disappointed that Soma is on the team, but Soma is actually really good at Cricket and played a lot back home where he assembled his own team at the palace. We also learn the unfortunate news that the Viscount of Druid is present and he is also Redmond's uncle. Let's all pour one out for Redmond. Can't believe that he had to be related to that thing. But that puts his weird comments to Ciel about his relationship with Lizzie into perspective. Um, big win though for the Frances Midford fans. She also hates the Viscount. I knew I liked that woman. Sebastian is growing worried about being recognized though since a lot of people who know him are now around. He tries to steer clear but Frances spots him. And we already know she's angry about his shaggy hair. However, his presence lets her know that Ciel is not attending Weston for the sake of going to Weston. They're there on business. Lizzie immediately recognizes Sebastian, which makes sense because I get the impression that she visits Ciel a lot, so she's around Sebastian pretty frequently. However, both Edward and Alexis do not realize who he is until Lizzie basically whispers it into their ears, indicating to me that they don't come to visit the Phantom Hive Manor uh, all that often. Which makes sense if Edward is attending school and I assume Alexis has a job. He stays busy <laughs> being the head of the Order of Knights, so like, I guess it makes sense. Ciel is shocked though that Edward hadn't noticed considering that he likely had classes with Sebastian and should have known. Like, Edward has been around for an undisclosed amount of time. I think it's been like a month or two. Something like that. <laughs> Our unobservant king. If Lizzie isn't involved, he's just not paying attention. Or I guess more accurately, he's only paying attention to Lizzie. So every time he's been around Sebastian, he just doesn't see the man. Edward does ask if Ciel's work has something to do with the cricket tournament, but Ciel assures him that even if it does, he can still go all out and do his best. I do think it's kind of sweet and thoughtful that Edward considered this as a possibility. Um, and asked about it, kind of like, I guess wanting to know if Edward needs to dial it back a bit and not try as hard so that Ciel can do his job. Um, so I think, I thought that was just really nice, a nice gesture on Edward's part. To Edward's dismay though, Lizzie wants to cheer for Ciel, <laughs> which is wild to him since those nerds don't stand a chance because they, they've never won. They just, they don't win. Except for the time that they did win. Alexis is so kind, offering that support to Ciel, letting him know that there is in fact a chance. Macmillan seems to overhear this though and butts in, over the moon to hear about the miracle of sapphires. He then quickly introduces himself as Ciel's best friend. No one tells Soma. <laughs> Honestly, Ciel's reaction here is so funny because we know he does not consider Macmillan an actual friend. At most, he's a useful person to know because he knows about the school and the students, but a friend? Also, their friendship is very different from his friendship with Soma, the only other person to claim Ciel as a best friend. But Soma knows Ciel in a more true sense than Macmillan has had the opportunity to know. Soma knows Ciel's faults and still loves him. Ciel sees Soma as a friend, even if it is begrudgingly. Yana Toboso has made a point to show the readers that Ciel feels at peace around Soma, feels comfortable, even when he is being terrible. Alexis then dives into the story of the Miracle of Sapphires. It took place when he was a student, a pretend butler for the Green Lions Prefect, just like Edward is today. It's flashback time. It's been a while since we had one of these. The green prefect is angry. Very angry. Because another prefect was slacking off on preparing for the June 4th cricket tournament. Who could that possibly be? Well, that slacker is none other than Vincent Phantom Hive. 
What a small world Alexis Medford resides in. His future brother-in-law. Oh, I don't think we've been formally introduced to Diedrich at this point in the manga, but we have seen him in the present day working with Ciel. Remember the fat man in chapter 3 and the German man that Ciel was on the phone with at the start of the murder arc? He's also seen in Calvin's flashbacks in the circus arc as well. Yes, that's the same guy as this Diedrich who's the prefect for Green Lion. He's got a past with Vincent, and a lot of people ship these two together, and I totally see it. It's one of the few ships in Black Butler that are canon enough to me, the other being Madame Red and Grell. <laughs> Vincent and Diedrich seem to have this lighthearted, contentious relationship as students, though. Lighthearted in the sense that Vincent is clearly not taking anything seriously, and Diedrich is annoyed by his lack of respect for the rules and traditions. Their personalities clash so badly, it creates this weird dynamic that a lot of people have fun exploring and pushing together in intimate contexts, which is probably why so many people who have read this far in the manga ship these two together. I actually don't know if it's that many people or if I have just existed in a bubble. <laughs> These two fight, and it doesn't matter who's around. Weston was probably wild back in the day with these two being around. Diedrich yells at Vincent for skipping out on preparations and complains that he had to pick up his slack. They wonder how Vincent was even appointed prefect in the first place, which leads Diedrich to insulting Sapphire Owl as a whole saying that if Vincent was prefect material, the rest of the house must suck. Not what he really said, but that's the meaning behind the words, more or less. Vincent does not take well to this, though. Diedrich can say whatever about Vincent, he doesn't care. But when it comes to the rest of the house, Diedrich's beef is with Vincent, not the others. Diedrich explains his point of view, though. In his eyes, a leader is the embodiment of those they lead. So the Sapphire Owl students obeying someone like Vincent shows that they amount to little, comparatively. Vincent will not let that slide, though. So he challenges Diedrich to a game, a bet on which house will win the tournament, and the loser has to comply with one demand from the winner. Diedrich is a bit taken aback. Sapphire Owl always loses. How can Green Lions possibly lose to them? It's preposterous, and a bet Diedrich is certain he'd win. So, if he wins, he'd have Vincent resign from the prefect position. A very small and non-greedy request. Vincent promises to come up with something if he wins, and that's that. Bet made. And Vincent does, in fact, win. It's the first time ever that Sapphire Owl has won the tournament. Vincent is just wild like that. It's really funny how we don't know much about this man, but aside from his demise, everything seems to work out for him. Luck is on his side. I'm sure there's more to it than that, but since we can't get his perspective on things, there's no way to know. We're led to the assumption that Vincent is just as sneaky and underhanded as Ciel often is when interacting with adults of the underworld. This has been more or less confirmed by the adults around him who also knew Vincent. We know that Vincent is a little silly and also would make rash decisions that Diedrich felt were stupid. We see this in his warnings to Ciel. Vincent also shows complete and utter disregard for tradition. It's just not something that he thinks is that important, and we see that same attitude in Ciel. Vincent's one request to Diedrich is for him to become Vincent's play butler, despite them being in different houses and Diedrich being a prefect despite being so unorthodox. But that doesn't matter to Vincent. A deal's a deal. No matter what, whenever Vincent calls for Diedrich, he must fly out. Diedrich, a bit confused, asks Vincent how long he thinks they have until graduation, which is not that long, but Vincent fully intends on this arrangement to outlast their time at school. He's not asking Diedrich to be his silly little play butler at Weston. He's securing a person to count on in the real world an ally, someone who's duty-bound to Vincent and someone he can trust. He calls Diedrich a faithful German dog of his own, which feels a bit odd to say. I don't know if it's weird flirting, a, a dig at Diedrich, or a 
dig at German people in general, it's really hard to say, probably a bit of everything mixed together. <laughs> There's no telling. This story is the first Ciel's ever heard of his father being in Sapphire Owl. It's also the first Edward and Lizzie heard of Alexis being a play butler back in the day. And I guess also the first time Edward realizes his father was younger than his uncle. It's so fun growing up and piecing together what family members are older than who. It just, I don't know, paints a whole new perspective. Alexis uses the story though to tell Ciel that he's got genius running through his veins. So a Sapphire Owl loss isn't something that's guaranteed. Ciel can win. It's a really sweet gesture on Alexis's part. On the one hand, telling Ciel a story Vincent never had the opportunity to tell him, and on the other, providing encouragement to Ciel. The Midfords really are a wonderful family and wonderful to Ciel as well, and I'm just, I'm so glad that he has them in his corner. And I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> After this story, it's time to draw lots for the tournament. Who's going up against who? But Ciel is using Sebastian to cheat in order to secure a lineup that Sapphire Owl can work with. Um, <laughs> Ciel does not believe in miracles. He's not leaving this up to chance. He's taking the win by force, and the opponent that allowed him to do so is Scarlet Fox. I want to be real here for a second. It makes so much sense that Ciel does not believe in miracles because nothing has worked out for this kid ever in his life except for whatever he can force out of fate with the demon at his side so this this makes sense for him it's time for the cricket tournament to begin i'll be real sports is a lot of like action where the activities take up a lot of page space not that there's anything wrong with that, it's really cool to see the action shots, but there's just not as much to chew on and digest here other than, wow, they play cricket, how fun! So we'll be zooming through the cricket arc. Um. <laughs> Sapphire Owl goes up against Scarlet Fox. It's the showdown to start the tournament. Redmond thinks they'll win, and Soma is like, hey, CL, you may beat me at chess, but this is where I excel. And if CL wasn't a dirty little cheater, this would have been such a fun, like, tables flipped scenario competitive aspect to their friendship. CL would have hated every second of it, though. <laughs> I do find it funny that CL is a little surprised that Soma is actually as good at cricket as he claims to be. But also, to be fair, Soma does seem like the kind of guy who is a chronic over-exaggerator, and it wouldn't be too wild to think that those at his palace would let him win. But Soma is actually good at the game for real. Anyway, Scarlet Fox is pretty good at cricket compared to Sapphire Owl. Wow, what a shocker. Who was surprised? Also, the servants are here. We didn't get to see them at the celebration the day before, but Mei Ren, Finny, Bard, and Tanaka are all here to support CL. They're so family coded. It's it's everything to me. I also think it's cute that Lizzie and Paula are also sitting next to them. Assumably like pretty close to the front lines and Macmillan is just next to Lizzie. <laughs> like he's integrating himself into the Phantom Fam or something. Just all of the people that are here to cheer on CL in one panel. Anyway, Bard explains the rules to the group and they grow confused on where CL is and how badly his team is doing. Bard also apparently cannot make meat pies. It's horrific. And now they're worried about Lizzie's safety when she eats it or if she eats it. This does serve as a fun little hint though as to how CL will win the game. The game goes on and it's not looking well for Sapphire Owl. Oh, and also Lau and Ran Mao are here. <laughs> Yeah, I guess they showed up to see CL. To be fair, Lau is like CL's older cousin friend, and I'm sure he'd love to see CL make a fool of himself playing sports. We all know that kid can't do this, honestly. Oh, no, bait, no. Lau's just here to facilitate gambling. Okay, that checks out, that checks out. The teams are on break, eating lunch, I assume, and discussing strategy. CL tells his team to leave it to him. He's got a plan. And boy, does he ever. <laughs> we see in the Scarlet Fox tent, everyone is eating as well. Their meat pies seem to be misplaced though. Huh, weird. 
but they made a special effort to make sure the meat pie was meat that Soma can eat. It is part of Hindu belief that cows are sacred and considered a part of the family in some ways, so you can see how eating beef wouldn't mesh well with those beliefs. Soma asks about the pie, and Redmond says that he believes it's made out of chicken, which Soma finds very considerate. Back in the game, though, things are not looking well for Sapphire Owl. The team is just simply outmatched. Ciel does not have the sports brain to do this correctly, or like the honest way, but he doesn't have to. I cast shit hat. Harcourt falls to his knees, and the rest of the team, aside from Soma, aside from Soma, doubles over in stomach pain. I cannot stress enough how much Soma is not affected by this. That is my biggest gripe with the musical adaptation of this arc. Soma is fine. He's fine. Everything is going to plan though. The rest of Scarlet Fox is not doing well and Ciel couldn't be more dementedly happy. Sebastian had swapped out the pies in Scarlet Fox tent just for this. They put laxative in the pies, extra strength laxative at, at that. Um, I do think it's funny just how dramatic this is. It's very silly and over the top and camp, I guess. <laughs> These guys don't want to shit themselves in front of everyone because that would be embarrassing, but also crude to expose the audience to such a sight. They're all wearing white, so it would be painfully and disgustingly obvious. Redmond is distressed though about leaving Harcourt out on the field, but he can't really go help him because he too is suffering this dilemma. Um, it does look like Harcourt just straight up died here, like a true rest in peace moment. This event is respectfully referred to as the shittening, and Harcourt fans across Tumblr either hate when it's brought up or love to make fun of him for it. And that's a wrap on the Sapphire Owl vs. Scarlet Fox battle. Sapphire Owl wins by default. <laughs> Jeez. Afterwards, Sebastian hands Tanaka the original beef mince pies, and Tanaka makes a joke about it. He asks if the pies will give him an upset stomach with a little bit of a wink. Tanaka knows. He's so silly for that too. Sebastian just laughs and assures him that it's fine. Tanaka then leaves with the notion that he's looking forward to another miracle of sapphires. This man absolutely knows that Sebastian and Ciel are cheating to secure a win, and he's just loving the show. Favorite old man for real for real. Macmillan has really just inserted himself into the Phantom Fam here. As they're eating, Soma is also joining the Phantom Fam, and Macmillan wonders how he's feeling since it seems that his entire team was taken out sick from something they ate at tea time, but Soma's fine. He explains that he's just built different. Good for him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Violet Wolves and Green Lions are battling it out. Neither team had to forfeit, so the game is still going. Luckily for Violet Wolves, Chesslock has magic fingers that allow him to be amazing at playing instruments and also putting special accelerating spins on the cricket ball. Green Lions seem to be struggling, and that is until their fearless leader, Green Hill, steps up, bringing Greenhouse the win. Good for them. Also terrible news for Ciel and Sapphire Owls, but I think this outcome was to be expected. Well, honestly, maybe it would have been terrible either way given Cheslock's special throw. Also apparently Violet was making the Violet Wolf Crest in the grass the whole game. He's just so silly. This does, however, make the final lineup Sapphire Owl versus Green Lions, just as it was when Alexis was in school for the first Miracle of Sapphires. History is repeating itself, and you know what? I didn't say it earlier, but I think this also like low-key implies that Vincent may be cheated as well. We hear a lot how Ciel is like Vincent, and with history repeating itself, that may lend more to what's being untold. Who knows, maybe Vincent and the others on his team were secretly cracked at cricket, or maybe he found a way to make up for what they lacked in physical and sport ability.
I also think it's funny how Ciel is like, we gotta win, not just for us, but for the red team who were regretfully eliminated. Like, bud, you know what you did. That's all on you. But anyway, it's time for the final showdown, and much to Edward's dismay, Lizzie is cheering on her fiancé. This is also probably amping up Edward's competitive nature. I'm not saying he wouldn't have given it his all if CL weren't there, but I think playing against his cousin and is in his mind fighting for Lizzie's attention is ramping Edward up to give more than his all. This will be the hardest he has ever played in his life. Maybe, I don't know. That's just the, the vibes that I get from his character. Now, cheating against green lions will not be as easy as cheating against the scarlet foxes. And it would be weird if both teams fell to the same kind of illness, so Sebastian has to come up with an alternative way to swing fate in their favor. Cheering on Sapphire Owl with a band! Live music on the field, much like how um, American football, like in high school and college, you'll have like the marching band playing music all throughout the game. It's something that's so normalized, at least like for me, but I guess it was frowned upon back in the day. <laughs> or at the very least, Green Lion's housemaster thinks that it is crass. However, it seems to help. But through Edward's observation, we learn that Sapphire Owl is playing with their eyes closed. We get a flashback to CL explaining the strategy to the team. They close their eyes and use music cues to know what to do, taking away the ability to essentially overthink the game and making it purely instinct based. There's a bit of opposition, mostly from Bluer, who thinks that it's not fair or sportsmanlike to play that way, but Ciel is able to reason with him. This is just a tactic, something that's playing to their strength, and wouldn't it be more fair to match up strengths to fight instead of trying to meet the other teams with their weaknesses? This strategy seems to be working really well. However, Greenhill and Edward both figured out the trick because they are just so smart like that. Edward has also got a trick up of his sleeve though, a trick that he did not want Greenhill to know about due to his trusting nature, but now is the time. Edward will meet CL's dirty little tricks with his own. I hadn't mentioned it yet, but the way that these guys have been calling out their special throws is a lot like how special fight moves in a typical action shonen series are called out and it is so silly to me. And a huge reminder that at the end of the day, Black Butler is in fact classified as an action shonen. In a lot of ways, it's in the same genres as like Naruto and Hunter x Hunter and Jujutsu Kaisen. <laughs> Although Jujutsu Kaisen might be a little bit more believable because both of these both of these series are really depressing. But also it provides this contrast of the more silly lighthearted fight compared to previous arcs of Black Butler. And I think that is really, really fun. I know a lot of people who disliked Western Arc back in the day disliked it because it was so lighthearted and silly in comparison, but I mean, that's just how life is, and I'm living for this taste of slice of life in the Black Butler universe. Anyway, Edward can also do the special throw that Chesslock did earlier, and everyone is flabbergasted. How could he possibly do that? We get a bit of insight into Edward's mind, though. He's just some guy. Just some guy surrounded by geniuses. Lizzie, Cheslock, the prefix. Instead of giving in to the frustrations of being beaten and being less than, he's decided to learn from them, to share in their joy. He's just some guy, yeah, but he's surrounded by geniuses that he can learn from. He can work to be better than just your average guy by following the example of those that he can look up to. Greenhill, though, considers Edward's honest respect and admiration for others as his greatest talent. He doesn't give in to envy if he even feels it at all, which I'm sure he does because he's human, but it's how he responds to those feelings that makes the difference. Most people easily get caught up in the self-pity and jealousy for others. I mean, I've done it, you've probably done it, that's just how people are. We're all prone to that kind of thinking but Edward is able to look past his own shortcomings to fully enjoy and celebrate those around him, and that's honestly amazing. During this climatic moment in the tournament, Sebastian spots the headmaster. For the first time in this entire arc, the headmaster is finally within reach. He must grasp his chance. 
Sebastian leaves the conducting of the band to Macmillan and rushes off to confront the headmaster. Now on the hunt for the headmaster, Sebastian has abandoned the music strategy, and Sapphire Owls are struggling in the tournament. Meanwhile, the headmaster is giving Sebastian the runaround. Sion now must resort to a different method, one that seems a bit silly, but is allowing for Sapphire Owls to actually catch the outs, keeping Green Lions from scoring. We don't get a reveal just yet, instead we get a flashback. Sebastian has the idea, Invite Lau to the tournament and he'll provide a very useful asset. This idea is very embarrassing to CL and Sebastian teases that it's too mature. Back in the present though, Edward is up to bat. He's not sure why everyone is so tense, but perhaps it's because this is the championship match? But he too ends up fumbling. Edward and the rest of Green Lions are distracted by Ran Mao and her pretty friends exposing so much leg. These boys have probably never seen such a thing before. At least Edward seems flustered and not really upset about it, but focusing on how the women should feel shame for showing so much skin. Fan service set in the Victorian era is just so fun, isn't it? I also think it's funny that the manga makes a note that the Sapphire Owl team has poor eyesight and genuinely have not noticed the distraction allowing for their win. Sapphire Owls are just built different, and they're not going to easily succumb to the, um, lust of man. <laughs> However, it's now time for Green Hill to bat, the prefect, the final boss of Green Lion. But he too is utterly helpless in the face of pretty women. This is so unserious. The Western Arc is just here to have a good time, and I love that. I love that. It knows exactly what it's here for. I also find it absolutely hilarious that... Ciel just doesn't get it. He thought this plan was so absurd and doubted if it would even work. Leave it to a demon to exploit human desires beyond the grasp of a emotionally traumatized and stunted 13 year old boy. But it's also a point that I think goes to characterize Ciel and his relationship or lack thereof um, with exploration of sexuality and romance. Yes, he's 13. I don't expect much from him, but around that age, many people start to think about their preferences in regards to romance, especially as they get into puberty. However, Ciel could not be less interested. Yeah, he's got his arranged marriage with Lizzie, who he cares for deeply, but I stand on the hill that his love for Lizzie is very platonic and familial, and not romantic. There's also the thought that he knows he's not going to live long enough to really form a lifelong relationship with a romantic partner. So what's the point? There's also, um, at this point in time in the manga, it's not confirmed, but it's heavily, heavily hinted at, and it does get confirmed later on. Ciel is a CSA survivor, so it makes sense that he just wouldn't be into that right now like not that every csa survivor has to be like sex repulsed but it just fits for ciel's character um it's a subtle characterization here and i'm not sure if that was like super intentional or more so a point towards ciel's naivety to certain things due to his age but we do see lizzie show a care for romance and it was something she was concerned with even at 13 and younger so I don't think it's completely outside of the realm of possibility or unfair to look at this as characterization towards CL's thought process when it comes to those sorts of things. Anyway though, the plan is foiled because Maurice Cole tattled and Lau and his harem of pretty women have now been shut down. I also think it's funny how Cole is mad and looking down on green lions for, for the distraction being so effective on them. Cole is like, it's just some pretty ladies, get it together, it's not that big of a deal. Sapphire Owls are now back at bat. They're still winning, but just barely. However, Ciel has another strategy that could help. Play defensively, basically. Physics or whatnot. They don't have to bat because the ball will recoil, and it'll be like they hit the ball, allowing them to score more runs and maintain a lead. Final inning, and Ciel and Blue were have one final strategy. It only, it's only going to work once though, so they have to be smart about it. Ciel is up to throw, and all of the outfielders have moved in on the batter. What could their plan possibly be? 
Meanwhile, Sebastian is still chasing down the headmaster in a wild goose hunt. The guy just seems to disappear as fast as he appeared. He's got the intent of evasion, and Sebastian must turn to his demonic skills to finally apprehend this man. Except, the headmaster is literally able to just disappear into thin air? Sebastian is befuddled. How could the headmaster just disappear, leaving his clothes like he just poofed out of existence? Sebastian is starting to figure something out. There's more to this than meets the eye, but it's time for him to return to the cricket field, where Ciel is throwing crazy balls, bouncing them off the ground pretty much, where they're hurling at the batter's face, forcing them to pretty much defend themselves instead of batting. It's a dirty trick, but one so very like Ciel. But this force of defense does cause the batter an out. He was just trying to protect himself, but the trajectory of the ball after bouncing off the bat worked as a hit. Wild how that plays out. Ciel is also able to defend himself against accusations of foul play. It is absolutely foul play in intent, but technically it's just simple. Ciel just lacks control of the ball, causing the wild throws. The team just so happens to be in catching distance. The batter for some reason or another hit the ball. It's all technicalities and technically fair play. I just know playing anything with or against CL must be an absolute nightmare. He seems like he would be a sore loser even when it was a game purely for fun without an investigation at stake. I also think it's funny how everyone gets upset about this and Bard says that they figured out how evil CL is. Bard knows his little guy is just the worst, but I'd like to believe that this was said with a level of affection. Let me be delusional until this airs in the anime and we can judge the line delivery here. Green Hill, though, thinks that this is alright, this is fair play. He's against heckling and he thinks that despite it all, Ciel is putting forth great effort. He's trying, and that's all that really matters. Greenhill recognizes that these tricks are just playing to Sapphire Owl's strengths, and it's the only way that they could have approached the Lions as equal opponents. Dirty trick or not, Ciel still had to train and work hard to achieve what they have done, and that's amazing. They've created a worthy opponent, and Greenhill is pleased to be able to go up against Bluer like this. Despite Greenhill's pep talk though, Ciel still has their team on edge. This evil little child is just too smart. Let the record stand, I don't actually think Ciel is evil, but when he's looking like this, it's hard not to call him that. Besides, I'm sure he'd take it as a compliment here if I said his cricket playing was evil. That's kind of the whole point. Edward is up to bat, but he's too strong to be affected by Ciel's little games. I'd also go as far as to say that they'd probably played together a lot growing up, and Edward is used to some underhanded tactics from his cousin. This, of course, would have been before the attack on the Phantom Hive Manor, and he may be thinking of the wrong twin, but I could easily see them getting up to shenanigans together, especially if there was any playful hostility about CL marrying Lizzie. We've also got the Easter chapter that was before this arc, where Edward could easily have witnessed CL's underhanded tactics. He knows what this kid is capable of to some degree, and he is not phased. He's used to it, even. This seems to please Ciel, though. He's smiling. This is all according to plan. He knew that Edward would not be thrown off by the silly mind games, and it's implied that he's smiling because things are going just as he thought they would, but I also would like to think that he's proud of Edward for being built different, and having fun trying to think of ways to best his cousin. Bluer, though, is now stepping up to throw the ball. Ciel's work has been done. We get a glimpse into Bluer's thoughts. His entire time at Weston, he'd been complacent, used to losing. But Ciel came along, weaker than the rest, but with the motivation and the drive to overcome that and win. He inspired Bluer to try hard and to do his best. There's more to Weston, to life, than studies and book smarts. Bluer wants to win. This nerd is using physics to throw the ball weird and still win. This whole sequence is just straight out of a sports anime. 
The upperclassmen, who is soon to graduate, reflects on their time at the school and what inspired them to try even harder than they ever have before in this last tournament. Their last chance, if you will. The training of the underdogs as they strive for an unlikely victory. The drive for the seniors to achieve that first victory ever before graduation. Pretty sure that this happened in Haikyuu. I'm like fairly certain this has happened multiple times in Haikyuu. <laughs> Sapphire Owls are holding their own, but Green Hill is up to bat and it's a P4 showdown. Bluer does his special throw and Green Hill is able to hit it, just barely missing clobbering CL in the head with the bat. It's a really powerful hit. Over dramatized, like Green Hill just obliterated an enemy in an action series, which technically he did. The visuals in this cricket match are actually really fun. And even though we're zooming through it, it's worth the time to really slow down and savor each and every over the top explanation and action packed panels. It's just plain fun, and we don't see stuff like this in Black Butler super often. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to, I guess, see Yana Toboso's range. <laughs> Green Lions are now only two points behind. The stakes are high, and if Green Hill hits the next throw, they'll tie up and win for sure. Ciel is able to hype Blue War up, though. If they lose, it doesn't matter because he gave it his all. They worked together to fight as one, to fight harder than they've ever fought before. Bluer has this one final throw, and just as before, Green Hill swings the bat back, ready to hit the ball from behind. Except this time, it doesn't matter if he hits it or not. It doesn't matter if they win, because Bluer's basically already won, in the sense that he's gone farther than he's ever gone before, and this was such a wonderful experience for the Sapphire Owl team. But how does it really play out for them? Instead of hitting the ball, Green Hill's bat comes in contact with CL's head. And he hit hard, <laughs> sending CL back to the ground and drawing blood. I know the bat is wooden and wood can scrape, but you know how hard you'd have to hit to break skin with that kind of hit? Like blunt force trauma to the head, CL probably got a concussion here. Green Hill is incredibly concerned about CL, ignoring the game to make sure that this little kid is okay, as he should, honestly, like that is the correct response. But CL takes advantage of that concern and reaches for the ball, knocking Green Hill out and winning the game. He put himself in harm's way just to win. Sapphire Owl has won once more, a repeat of the miracle of Sapphires. Phantom Hives are just built different, I guess. Ciel puts on the show of a lifetime as he claims to be so happy about winning with everyone that he forgot about the injury on his head, as if that kid didn't plan for this to happen. After bringing everyone to tears and doing his damnedest to be THE MVP, Ciel is carried away by Sebastian to have his wounds tended to, and Sebastian sees through all the crap. <laughs> Going as far as teasing CL for what he said in front of everyone. Sebastian is honestly having too much fun throwing CL's fake persona back in his face. But like, honestly, it is fun. I'll have to give him credit where it's due. We're also now privy to the full extent as to how CL cheated. Apparently, they gave Bluer a ball that was weighted differently to make the throws work. Something that no one noticed. So like, good for them, I guess. I don't think that's within regulations. Ciel also explains the thought process behind his plan to win against Green Hill, explaining how he knew getting injured would work. But Ciel does share confusion on how Bluer and the others could be content with just trying their best, even if they knew they would be beat. Ciel plays to win, and doing his best in a situation is not enough. It doesn't matter. And honestly, I get it. It's very important to do your best, but it also feels nice to win. With certain types of video games, usually mobile games, stuff like Clash of Clans, things that don't really matter, I'm not going to do something unless I know I can win. Just doing my best is not a part of the fun for me. I will say I have grown out of that though, and regularly enjoy the process of getting my ass beat in Baldur's Gate until I figure out how to best the enemy. But I do understand CL's drive to win, and the process of how you get the win be damned. It doesn't matter. That's not where the joy lies. 
He's not there for the joy of simply playing, but I also think the hidden stakes of the match and the stakes to what Ciel does for the queen, he can't really afford to enjoy the process. It doesn't matter that he did his best if he fails and dies. Ciel is pretty much stuck in survival mode, and these more frivolous challenges are a bit beyond his understanding. Sebastian informs Ciel of his failure to capture the headmaster, so it looks like the win and Ciel's show-stopping performance out on the field may come in handy after all, and the entire Sapphire Owl house is grateful for Ciel. He's made himself a valuable part in what happened, and everyone knows it. It's time to celebrate now. As per tradition, after the cricket tournament, the winning team has a boat ride. The team, all dressed up, is to sail down the river, salute the queen, place flowers from their hat in the water, then head back. The rest of the students place lanterns on the water. It's my understanding that this is an actual thing at the real life school that Weston is based off of, which is pretty neat. During the boat ride, or the canoeing, or whatever, whatever they're doing, Bluer realizes that this team, for as hard as they practiced and as hard as they worked, they didn't actually expect to win, so they were sorely unprepared for the actual rowing of the boat. Which, yeah, I have been canoeing before and it sounds like they may have been sailing for a good bit, but to flip the boat? <laughs> That's wild. But it is a cute moment that seems to make everyone laugh. Fireworks over the water, this is the sports anime send-off for the senior who, despite the odds, was able to secure a win. Bluer seems really happy and at peace here, which is really great for him. Once everyone is back from the boat ride, the celebrations are in full swing. Everyone is having such a great time. That night, after the festivities, Ciel returns to his dorm only to find an invitation to the midnight tea party. Ooh, this is everything. This is what he was vying for. This is what the entire story arc was building up to. This is what Weston is all about. This is what he needs to make contact with the headmaster and to finally get some leads on this investigation. All Ciel must do now is wait for someone to come for him at midnight to escort him to the party. Once midnight falls, Clayton is the one who will escort Ciel, giving us this wonderful panel that is perfect for reaction images, and ever since I wrote that in the script, I've had so many instances where that was an appropriate reaction image. I've used it a lot lately. Sorry to all of my friends who don't know what Black Butler is. <laughs> anyway, Ciel has finally done it. He's reached the elusive midnight tea party. Yana Toboso sets the mood with creepy visuals and indicators of unsettling music being played throughout the hall, but Ciel finally makes it to the garden. Full moon in the sky. The prefix and their play butlers are there, as is the headmaster. They sit around a table, having tea. Ciel finds now to be the best time to bring up Derek Arden and the other missing students again saying that he cannot earnestly toast without seeing them. He's ruining the vibes again, but this time he has a really solid defense. Sure, he's being rude, but part of the code of conduct at the school is to treat the other students with love and affection, kindness and care. He's heard these students have not returned home and have shut themselves away, so it's only natural for him to be concerned. He explains how their parents begged him to talk to these missing students and convince them to return home just once, just so everyone could know that these kids were okay. Ciel explains how his efforts to contact them were met with really odd scenarios, explained how Violet claimed everyone was safe from the fire when students were clearly missing, students who should have been in the Violet Wolf dormitory. Redmond tries to explain it away, saying Violet lost his head, which is a fair assessment. That was a stressful scenario, and Violet is only human. But Ciel is not buying it. It's not a good enough excuse. Ciel continues to put up a fuss, explaining his point of view and how he needs to see these students. The prefix play butlers seem to react in shock and concern, but the prefix hold expressions that are a bit darker in tone. Expressions that express worry, shame, irritation, and guilt. Ciel asks the headmaster to request assistance from the yard, but he's shut down. The vice headmaster says that that will not be necessary because the students are right here. 
And as if on cue, Derek Arden enters the midnight tea party, walking, talking, seemingly fine. Derek Arden is here in the flesh. Cheslock seems totally unbothered, probably grateful to have this whole mess resolved after the fuss CL has been putting up, but Greenhill is shocked, asking if Derek is really okay. Derek Arden is here, but there's something off about him, something inhuman. He leans down and takes a huge bite into Greenhill's arm. Edward jumps into action, kicking Arden away, revealing all too familiar stitching across Arden's forehead. The Bizarre Dolls are back, baby. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and Ciel is not going to play around. He calls for Sebastian. Now is not the time for hiding the demon's identity, so, like, none of this matters. His life and the lives of those around him are at stake, and Edward should not be put in the position to fight these things off again, like on the Campania. Sebastian is able to apprehend Derek Arden, and it's fairly apparent that this little phantom hive boy and the new housemaster are not who they seem. Ciel comes clean about his reasons for attending Weston, and explains that there was no way for Sebastian to sense the whereabouts of a dead person. It's also interesting to note that this whole time Derek Arden has only been repeating that he detects the wonderful aroma of tea. It's the only thing he can say, and the vice headmaster states that the episodes were too rough in the end. Whatever that means. Ciel holds a gun to the headmaster, demanding answers. Clayton, still not grasping what's going on and the full gravity of things, cries out. What has gotten into him? But Edward is already aware of Ciel's situation, and steps up, saying that they need to step down and not question the Earl of Phantom Hive. Ciel demands once more, what happened to Derek Arden? Greenhill speaks up, though. They'd only sought to protect. St. George, the symbol of their college, slayed a dragon in order to protect the peace, to protect his country. The prefix did the same. They dealt with Derek Arden, killing him. We get a flashback to the night that it happened, how the prefix reacted, Greenhill feeling the weight of his actions, Redmond stepping up to justify what they had done and to cover it up. Redmond was able to get in contact with Dr. Ryan Stoker, yes, that Ryan Stoker, and his sketchy research partner. This news puts the puzzle pieces together for Ciel and Sebastian. Redmond explains that he and the others made a pact with him, the man behind it all. The headmaster, or as we've known him for the last 80-something chapters, Undertaker. The cat's out of the bag. But instead of jumping into aggression, Undertaker seems pleased to see CL, even speaking with him like old friends or a family member catching up after a while. Sebastian talks about how he'd wondered where Undertaker went after closing up shop. Our man is now unemployed. Or, well, he was until he became headmaster, but I assume that position um, will probably open up here pretty soon. Undertaker in his retired era, if you will. Back to the prefix, though. Just what was so important that these guys would murder another student? According to them, Derek Arden was a student who should have never been admitted in the first place. About a year ago, when the prefix were first appointed, life was simpler. Excitement and joy over being prefix and the privileges that come with it. These guys were living life. But there was an instance of bullying that they were tasked with keeping an eye out for. Derek Arden was placed in charge of handling the bullying case, though. He was dependable, talented, and a stand-up guy. His charm blinded them to the shadows that he harbored under the surface. One night, while reprimanding a student, Redmond eventually asks Arden if he's made any progress in the bullying case, to which Arden responds that he has not seen anything unusual. But there was a poem dedicated to the prefix in the letterbox, Thinking nothing of it, he read it to Redmond, who figured out that it was some kind of secret message directed to the prefix. A secret code that, when unraveled, gave a date and a time and a location. They must go to the music room at a certain time. And that 
is where they find it. Derek Arden and a group of others essentially torturing other students, beating them, using their work as his own, much like how Maurice Cole got others to do his work, stealing away the light. Derek Arden's rotten personality is then revealed. He didn't even want to attend Weston in the first place, but it was expected of him. He was also expected to become a prefect, so he'd blow off steam by torturing other students. Derek Arden was vile, and he was an affront to everything Weston was supposed to be, and he threw the weight of his father's contributions to the school around, almost as if that made him untouchable. The prefix, though, being young and naive, still thought that authority worked the way that it was supposed to, stating that they'd get the vice headmaster to report this. But the vice headmaster was there, aware of everything and ready to cover it up. The prefix pretty much learned about corruption within leadership that night, as Derek Arden and the headmaster walked away, pretending nothing happened, talking about being a prefect the next year. Greenhill felt he must take action. He grabbed the cricket bat and struck. Blunt force trauma to the head, much like what he thought he may have done to Seal at the cricket tournament. The tradition of Weston would be undermined if Derek Arden and the vice headmaster were allowed to stay and continue their corruption, and the prefix could not allow that. Violet held the doors while Redmond and Bluer helped apprehend the vice headmaster. Greenhill struck down once more. Swift killing blows in the name of absolute tradition. They killed everyone in that room, and while I don't think that that was, like, the right thing to do, I understand. These were kids who had just had their entire world crumble beneath them. Just witnessed, likely for the first time, the cruel way that authority is bent to benefit those with power. Derek Arden and the Vice Headmaster did need to be dealt with, but the prefix were in no position to hold them accountable. In that moment, killing was a rash decision, a crime of passion, but it was one that they felt was their only option, the only choice they could make. And it is something that they deeply regret. In a way, this night has trauma bonded the prefix. Greenhill feels that he should shoulder all of the blame since he was the one who actively murdered everyone, but they each had a hand in it. They each felt a level of responsibility, so Redmond, Violet, and Bluer grab a bat together and drive it into Derek Arden so that Greenhill was not the only one who had committed violence. But that's okay. It was all for Weston. All for tradition. I do find it interesting how each of the prefix seemed to be dealing with this after the fact. We'd seen that Greenhill took a vow to never be violent again. Redmond and Bluer both seem to be ignoring it to the best of their abilities, but Violet has been the most visibly shaken. Although that was probably done to hint at the fact that Violet and the others were hiding something, it's a really interesting characterization. Yana Deboso like low-key made Violet baby girl in a way. Something about him is just wet paper bag of a man and it invokes a desire to protect or something. The headmaster was also away during this time, on a trip around the world, and wouldn't return until next autumn, meaning that the prefix felt their responsibility to handle everything. They were the ones who must protect the school, they were the ones that were left in charge. It's a great deal of responsibility for four teenagers. They acknowledged that they did the loved ones of Derek Arden and the others wrong, but it was a necessary evil. Blue returns to CL, stating that surely he'd understand. And we know CL would get it. This this kid should get it. He has made similar decisions before, albeit with higher stakes, like framing Woodley for murder to atone for the real crimes he's committed. Um, but CL is shocked. And he wonders how Bluer could say that when they took their lives. Some may say that this is out of character for Ciel, or that he's still putting on a show, but I don't think so. He's already taken off his mask, and I believe this is a genuine response. We've seen Ciel advocate for not killing people in the past, and when you really look at it, he's only killed or allowed Sebastian to kill when it was absolutely necessary, self-defense even. When Ciel is in his right mind, he does not turn to killing others when he doesn't absolutely have to. 
However, in a way, the Prefix were in a position where they felt like they had to as well. So Ciel does understand, even if the stakes are so low, he himself wouldn't have turned to murder in that exact scenario. Undertaker seems to find all of this amusing, though. He himself knows that Ciel has gotten his hands dirty in the past, so seeing Ciel react like this is pretty wild from an outsider's perspective. And Sebastian is also amused by this response. He himself has killed on Ciel's behalf. He's cultivated a level of cruelty within Ciel over the past few years. He has seen Ciel at his worst and has witnessed Ciel cause death to many who probably didn't deserve to die. So it's weird seeing this kid kind of be hypocritical in a way. The Prefix continue to defend their actions. They can't defile Weston's legacy. Derek Arden and the others would have defiled that history and that image. They honestly already were, and if anyone knew about it, surely that would cause issues for the school. These kids, the Prefix, feel a weight of the world on their shoulders, the weight of having to protect the school and their fellow students and the legacy of Weston. It's a lot of pressure to put on someone, especially for teenagers who honestly should be focusing more on their schoolwork and interpersonal relationships. And I, I don't know, being teens? I know teenagers weren't considered like a thing until the 1910s, and even then, like the term teenager wasn't super popularized until it was used a lot in marketing much, much later. Um, so teens, especially older teens, would have been seen more as like adults. Legally, I don't think they were considered adults at this time, but socially they pretty much were. And child psychology and just development wasn't really studied as much back then, so it makes sense that no one thought it was strange to more or less treat these teenagers like adults who could handle all of that pressure. But it does explain what's going on here, I think. And while they're not children in the sense of like, being under 13 years old, I believe the prefix were around 18, like 17 to 18 range. We know that most people's brains are not fully developed until 25, so the prefix prefrontal cortex was still cooking, and I do think that they may have come to a different conclusion if their brain was fully developed, since the prefrontal cortex helps with a multitude of things like decision making and like um, impulse control and stuff like that. So I do think if they were older, maybe it would have played out differently. And I, I do think that should be taken into consideration when talking about the prefix. I mean, yeah, they made the decision that they made. There's no changing that, but it's just more interesting to like think about why they would have made that decision. Try to like figure out why they felt so indebted and why they felt like they had no other choice. So, cause I don't think they're bad people. And we see that in a way it was a necessary evil because they got rid of someone who was much, much worse than they were. Um, it doesn't make it okay though. I wanna make that clear, I don't condone murder. <laughs> Ciel recognizes that the students at Weston are more or less brainwashed, believing themselves slaves to tradition. In a way, the Weston arc almost feels like a critique on institutions that create an environment of extreme loyalty. I can't say for certain what exactly Yana Deboso had in mind when creating this, be it her own experiences at school exaggerated here or something else. It is kind of interesting though. People do get very swept up into these kinds of things. Ciel promises that although he can't keep this a total secret, he'll make sure to work something out that takes the prefix situation into account, which is honestly the best thing he can do for them. But now, he must confront Undertaker once more. This is the second time that Undertaker has caused problems, and we already know he's an adversary that will not be easy to fight. Luckily, Undertaker is in a good mood though, having plenty of laughter from watching Ciel pretend to be a normal boy. He explains that he's figured out how to keep the Bizarre Dolls moving and more lifelike, by using the corpse's longing for a future instead of longing for a soul. He was able to make advances in this little experiment. Undertaker figured out that he could take the snippets of future possibilities to extend the cinematic records instead of making gibberish like before. 
but it's still not perfect. Not everyone has the same level and strength of wishes for the future, and that would explain why Derek Arden's corpse wasn't as advanced as the Vice Headmaster. Sial wonders why Undertaker wants to revive the dead, to which Undertaker answers that he simply wants to look past the faded end. He thinks that maybe something amusing could happen beyond the credits. He's looking for the post credit scenes, basically. Sebastian disagrees, though, considering death a beauty, but that's all Undertaker can share. It's time for him to leave, and on his way out, to keep Ciel and Sebastian from fighting him, he summons the other dolls, Derek's accomplices. It's a smaller version of the Campania disaster, but just in the garden. Saving the Prefix and their pretend butlers takes priority here. Undertaker muses on how Ciel may have Phantom Hive blood, but he is so different from his predecessors. This is the first time anyone has commented on how Ciel is different from Vincent or any of the other Phantom Hives that came before him. Undertaker is commenting on who Ciel is at his core. Not who Ciel pretends to be, not the mask he puts on to survive the cruel world. Undertaker sees right through that, and he sees the kindness and care that shines through every once in a while. I'd also say Undertaker probably knows Ciel is not who he says he is. I mean, this man just feels like he's got to know that this is the other twin here. Maybe I only feel that way because I subscribe to the Grandpa Undertaker theory, but it's just, he's got that vibe, you know? Like, he just feels like he knows. Sebastian and Undertaker continue to talk. He accuses Undertaker of underestimating him, thinking that the little doll of the Vice Headmaster would be enough to hold him off. But Undertaker acknowledges that they're equals. The only thing that sets them apart is their goals. Their goals. Sebastian's main goal right now is to enact Ciel's revenge and eat his soul. So what does that make Undertaker's main goals? This may be an important conversation to remember. At the time of writing and recording this, the manga has not really revealed what the Undertaker's goals and motivations are just yet, but there's a lot of theories going around as to just how involved Undertaker may be in the Phantom High family and how that involvement gives him motivation to try and prevent Sebastian from taking Ciel's soul. And there's just a lot of little hints here and there that make a story of Undertaker being very emotionally invested in the Phantom High family for whatever reason. So, this is, I know for a fact this is foreshadowing, I just don't know what it's foreshadowing just yet because it has not happened yet in the series at the time of recording this. I'm gonna be saying this a lot now that we are getting closer and closer to catching up. <laughs> Whatever they were foreshadowing though, Sebastian seems to have figured it out. But before he can finish the thought, they start fighting. Sebastian worries that Undertaker will eventually take Ciel hostage again, which is funny because Sebastian has to save him. It's a great upper hand to have in the fight, but I don't think Undertaker would actually harm Ciel, not beyond putting him in situations where Sebastian has to save him at the demon's detriment, or maybe do something that, um, jeopardizes the contract, but Ciel himself is never actually in danger, if you count knowing Sebastian would save him as not being in danger. But nevertheless, Sebastian is concerned and has to place Ciel's safety above all else, so he steps down, leaves Undertaker and rushes to Ciel's side. Undertaker knew that this was what the demon would do, and before he parts, he hopes that Sebastian will continue to protect Ciel so loyally. It's almost as if Undertaker was testing Sebastian, confirming that Ciel's safety was number one priority. It's as if Undertaker is invested in Sebastian protecting Ciel, whether that's information he'll use against Sebastian again, or information that brings him comfort because he's concerned with Ciel's safety. There's no other way to tell for certain at this point. Ciel asks why Sebastian didn't run after Undertaker. I mean, he'd ordered him to apprehend the Undertaker after all. But Sebastian shuts that down. Per the terms of the contract, Ciel's safety is top priority. And besides, after all the work Sebastian has done into cultivating Ciel, he cannot afford for Undertaker to steal Ciel away. This feels like foreshadowing. <laughs> this, it's... There's been a lot of things foreshadowing, um, starting in this arc, I believe, and we see stuff here and there in future 
chapters that really do make it feel like Undertaker might be trying to um, save Ciel from his fate of being food. And this just, this feels related. But I also feel crazy because there's nothing directly stating that in the manga. It's not something that's been revealed yet. And this could be foreshadowing something else entirely. But that's where I'm putting my money right now. <laughs> I also think that it's kind of fun how in this moment, Sebastian is more creature than man. A stark reminder that he's just playing for the contract. He's not a kind man. He's not a tutor or a butler. He is a demon parading around until the contract is complete. It's still subtle though, and like he's not full on creature mode, but the cold nature in which he speaks is a reminder enough for Ciel and the readers, at least for now. Finishing up the midnight tea party, Sebastian's taking care of the corpses in the garden, and Edward has helped everyone escape safely. He rushes back in to help and let Ciel know. Edward expresses fear and discomfort that he too may have ended up like the prefix, and committed murder thinking that that was equal to justice. It's here we get a clear look into what lays in Edward's heart. He's got an idealistic thought process here, but he knows that what the law doesn't handle, the Queen's watchdog take care takes care of. He knows in some twisted way that justice does eventually catch up to those who do wrong. Ciel tells Edward that the fear he feels makes him normal, unlike Ciel. Which sounds to me like Ciel is considering himself much worse as of a person than he actually is. Something we see him do a lot, actually. Afterwards, Ciel did tell the queen everything, the full account of what had come to pass. We don't know if he specifies like, oh yeah, grim reapers exist and they're like meddling and supernatural forces, but we do know he tells her about reviving the dead. The prefix were expelled from Weston, but faced no legal punishment as far as I could tell for what they had done, which I think seems pretty fair. Maybe a bit lax, but they suffered enough for what they'd done and they clearly regret their actions and were making efforts to never do anything like that again. After a bit of time outside of the extreme environment of Weston, perhaps they'd even be able to grow past that brainwashing and grow from this whole thing. Leave it all in the past and learn from their actions. So, I don't think they're dangerous and need to be in prison, so like, it works out, it's fine. Ciel does clarify that the expulsion was more of a cover-up for what happened than like any form of punishment, and that he felt it was crueler than death considering how the prefix had previously chosen to protect the school and its traditions over human lives. But I would argue that getting them out of that environment was probably the best thing for them. Like, yeah, they got expelled and that's going to affect their future and like getting kicked out of this prestigious school is definitely going to make um, just like maybe future networking just a little difficult and because people would be like, yo, what happened? Didn't you get kicked out of school? Like, maybe I don't want to network with this guy. So like, I could see that negatively impacting their future, but that's nothing compared to the obvious break they needed from such a stiff and brainwashing environment and they definitely need the space to grow past that and they're not gonna get that if they stayed at Weston and graduated. Maybe they would after the fact, but it's beside the point. As for the dead students, they were all claimed to be accidental deaths in a boating accident. Those who knew the truth were silenced by an order and went off to live as if nothing had happened. Edward, Clayton, Cheslock, and some random unnamed guy from Scarlet Fox step in as the new prefix. Harcourt does not become prefect for Scarlet Fox, but he is only a second year, and I believe it's only seniors that are appointed prefix, which makes sense. But these new, this new group does not share the same glee as the previous prefix did when getting their new positions. After what they've learned, it's tainted. Ciel also explains to the queen about the reanimated corpses, and she seems to believe him. After meeting with the queen, Ciel can finally return home, though, and leave this whole ordeal behind him, leaving the version of himself that went to Weston in the past. And terrible news for Macmillan fans, Ciel does not want to continue that friendship, even telling Sebastian to throw away Macmillan's parting letter. 
As they return home, Xiao is greeted with the Three Ring Circus. Lambs are all over the place as well. <laughs> A local farmer's sheep are on the loose. Xiao notices himself defaulting back to Weston's rules as he watches Finney race across the grass to stop one of the sheep from infiltrating the herb garden. And as he catches himself thinking about the no walking on the grass rule, he laughs. A lawn is just a lawn. Touching grass is good, actually. I need to do it more often. Sebastian does later open the letter from Macmillan, revealing the photo that he sent of Ciel and the Sapphire Owl team. It came out nicely, but he was asked to dispose of it, so he throws the photo and the letter into the fire. We never know what the letter actually said. It's probably not important, and it was probably well wishes and regards from Macmillan and a desire to stay friends. Back at the palace, though, the queen is discussing the matter of reanimated corpses with one of her servants. I believe this is John Brown. I don't think we've gotten a name for this character yet, but I know he shows back up in the Green Witch arc in a couple of chapters from this one, so we'll confirm it later, I guess. She expresses a desire to have the monsters be on her side. They would be troublesome to have to fight against these corpses, so might as well try to gain them or something. I'm sure this will come up again later. What exactly is she cooking? As the Western arc comes to a close, it's time for the silly, lighthearted, in-between breather chapter, which is fun because Weston in and of itself was a fairly low stakes arc, so a breather chapter doesn't necessarily feel like it's needed, but here we are. A day like any other at the Phantom Hive Estate. The servants are doing their thing, of course. Ciel is making plans to go visit someone, and that also turns into a shopping trip as everyone seems to need something. But as per usual, the day is interrupted by Soma barging in. I love how he just seems to have an open invitation to come by, just like Lizzie does. Soma is upset, though, that Ciel withdrew from school and didn't tell him. He was supposed to stay, and the two of them could study together. Soma explains that school is really boring without him, and that the work is too easy. This man is not being stimulated. He studied all of that as a child already, so he's kind of just wasting time. This revelation does come as a shock to Ciel and Sebastian, who both viewed Soma as a bit of an airhead. So they were like, wow, you know things? You know more things? <laughs> Agni is also here, of course. He says it's been a while, to which Sebastian revealed that he knew Agni was at Weston just the other day. It hadn't been that long. Much to Agni's surprise as well. We get a flashback that explains why Soma didn't fall to the laxative CL had Sebastian put in the meat pies. Agni had made a special chicken pie for Soma, and despite believing that Sebastian had beat him to it, he really wanted Soma to eat his pie. So that's how Soma didn't get sick. We love Agni in this house. Soma's a bit mad that Agni disobeyed him. But while they're distracted, Ciel and Sebastian try to slip out to go run their errands, leaving Soma and Agni to watch the house. The rest of the chapter is Phantom Fam shopping. It's really cute. They talk about London Bridge and how the plans for construction started before Ciel was even born. We get a glimpse of it, and hey, that looks just like the place where Ash Landers and Sebastian fought it out at the end of season one. I know it's literally just the London Bridge, but it's still kind of funny. Sebastian also kind of like jokes about how humans live such short lives but they move so slowly like geez i'm sorry humans can't construct a bridge like this in the blink of an eye weird flex or whatever <laughs> may Rin gets new glasses and she can finally see again finny gets a new straw hat snake gets a new bag to carry his snakes around in bard asks for porn but sebastian reprimands him for doing so Ciel picks up a new book from Arthur Conan Doyle, what a fanboy, and then Ciel gets barred some candy cigarettes. A kind jester so he's not empty handed, but also Ciel doesn't want Bard losing his taste from smoking too much. It's presented like he's being selfish, but underneath that like I don't want you to lose your taste because you'll be bad at cooking is a layer of genuine care for Bard, and we all know Sebastian's the one that mainly cooks, so 
Xiao's just saying things to hide how kind he's being. And I just think that's sweet. Sebastian then makes a request to stop at Somerset House, a government building with documents in it, more or less. Sebastian is hoping to investigate Undertaker's morning lockets. He can use the death dates, place of manufacture, and the names on the lockets to find more out about Undertaker, allegedly. However, the only thing that seemed to be point of interest was a Claudia P, learning the P stood for Phantom Hive. Claudia Phantom Hive is Ciel's grandmother, by the way, and why would Undertaker carry a mourning locket for her? It is a clue that Undertaker has worked not only with Vincent, but Vincent's mother as well. This paired with Undertaker's vibe when it comes to the lockets makes Ciel wonder what his relationship with the Phantom Hive house is. It's Grandpa Undertaker theory. It's Grandpa Undertaker. <laughs> That's Ciel's grandpa. Let me reiterate, that is just a theory. One, I believe, but there's not much canonical evidence. I need to make that clear before someone takes my word as truth. I am just saying things. Grandpa Undertaker theory is not canon. <laughs> it is not. Not yet, at least. After this lore drop, we then move on to the main reason for this outing. Phantom Company has a new line of products, and everyone is roasting Ciel for the choice in mascot. Even Lizzie roasted him for it. Sebastian also teases Ciel for attempting to market to women, but missing the mark entirely. He is but a teenage boy. Suddenly, there is a carriage accident just outside. Sebastian rushes out to help them, revealing that those in the carriage were none other than Irene, the actress we met in the murder party arc, and another actor that we've never met, but it's Irene's new boyfriend, so RIP to Grimsby, I guess. Irene laments on being late for curtain call, and Sebastian gets an idea. He rushes the carriage to the theater where she's supposed to be, getting her there just in time. Well, not really. The show has already started, and she is firmly late, but it's just in time for her entrance. Irene and her character ride in on a unicorn making a dramatic entrance and advertising Phantom's new products while she's at it. Are you telling me that Sebastian invented product placements in media? I initially said this as a joke, but I did research this after I wrote it into the script, and the first documented product placement was in 1896, which is, I think it is 1899. 89? 1889? In the Western Arc? Several years. Several years after Black Butler takes place. <laughs> Back at the shop, Ciel and gang are waiting impatiently for Sebastian's return. But before them is a group of women, all here to purchase the new Phantom perfume. Also, Sebastian is in his furry arc, and Ciel firmly resorts to celebrity endorsement to market his new perfume. Anyway, that's the end of the chapter. There was no fun segue to the next arc, but that's, that's okay. Well, that's the Western arc in its entirety. We went to school. There's a lot less overarching lore and flashback that connects to the main storyline that's dropped in this arc compared to the last, but what is dropped is huge. I do believe the main role that the Western arc plays in the overarching plot is a bridge of some sorts, connecting the whole Bizarre Doll thing from the Campania arc to future arcs by showing their advancement and planting the seeds for Queen Victoria's involvement. There's also the huge clue that Undertaker was involved with Ciel's grandma to some degree that will be coming up again. Not only do we have these clues and seeds being planted, but we also get to know characters that will show up again and be important later. There's a lot of wonderful characterization going on here that also furthers our understanding of the characters we already know. I feel like this arc gives us a deeper look into what Ciel is like, his ideals and his values, and it's also interesting to see him struggle to connect with kids his age after spending the last three years pretending to be an adult, more or less. We get to know Edward at a much deeper level as well, and I do believe that this is going to be important characterization later on. It's fleshing out Ciel's family and giving us further insight into their dynamic and also allowing the reader to care more about these people. That's also true for the new characters as well. I won't say how, 
but the prefix do show back up again, as does Cheslock, Harcourt, and Clayton. Building this connection to these characters now allows for the readers to care more about them when they come back. I would say in less lighthearted manner, but as of right now, the only other times they return in the manga is more or less in a lighthearted mood. Anyway, that's enough about future arcs. The Weston arc is a foundational bridging arc between what came before it and what's to come next. Even if most of the arc is spent on low stakes school shenanigans, it still has a place, and that should not be overlooked. It's fun, it's camp, it's silly, but at the same time, there's something off. Something deeper and darker, and in a way, the Weston arc pretty much sums up Black Butler as a whole. All aspects of this series, the highs and the lows. I don't have a whole lot more to say about it. There was no analysis that I wanted to leave until the end. So with that, I end our school term. But you may want to study a bit of German, because our next stop is somewhere deep in the woods in Germany. As Ciel and Sebastian investigate some weird wolves or something, we'll have to find out in the next arc. Thank you guys so much for watching this. I know you guys waited a really long time for the Weston Deep Dive. Um, I don't know how long it's going to be when I'm done editing, but it is over three hours. <laughs> I have been recording for like probably closer to four hours. Um, so that's fun. There was a lot to cover. There was a lot to say. And I fear the Green Witch arc is going to be similar. So look forward to that. Ideally, the Green Witch arc I'm wanting to put out at some point in March. That's my plan. Thank you so much for being patient. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this, this, uh, deep dive. I hope you all are excited for the anime and if you somehow didn't know everything we just covered in this video is getting an anime adaptation that is coming out I think in April is when it starts it's it's starting like this spring um dating the video woo anyway bye